All right, how are we looking, Dylan? We're looking good. Uh, if there's anybody in the attendees room that uh, is supposed to be a presenter or panelist as a subcommittee member, and I, I haven't admitted you, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll bring you into the meeting. I, I think I've got everybody, but I know we've got some folks sitting in for other subcommittee members. So please raise your hand and I will admit you into the meeting. Before I forget to thank you, Dylan, I want to make sure everybody knows how much effort you put into making these things come together pretty flawlessly. I, I don't think the background looks quite like the flight control center. I think you need to run one of these, but sure appreciate your help. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Happy to help. I, it certainly hasn't been flawlessly, but uh, glad we're making these work. So thank you. Randy, Dylan needs a lot of coffee. <laughs> All right, with that, I think we'll get going. Um, Dylan, did you want to, any uh, regular technical stuff you want to address with anybody before we get started or are we good? Um, I don't think so other than if, uh, you know, we'll be doing the public comment and I think everybody here, oh, there's Bill, I'll admit Bill in. Um, if you have uh, a question or comment during public comment, please raise your hand and that will help me identify you. And then if everybody could please update their names uh, so that folks know who you are. And uh, yeah, other than that, We'll get rolling. Okay, thanks. And so the for well, first, welcome everybody. I'm Randy Arnold, and I'm the regional supervisor for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks out of Missoula, and a chair of the NCDE. And um, we did introductions yesterday, and I I don't think we'll go through introductions again, but I do want to take a moment to uh, introduce some folks who weren't able to join us yesterday. Um, so first, I think I'll go to. Uh, Bill Avey, the vice chair. Morning, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Sorry I couldn't make it yesterday, but I know Sarah gave me a report out of the day. Uh, so appreciate being able to be on today. Looking forward to the dialogue. Great. Thanks, Bill. And I see Kurt Steele is with us today. Good morning, Kurt. Yeah, good morning again. Same with Bill. Uh, apologize for not being able to join yesterday, but uh, happy to be here today. And let's see, uh, we have Chris Temple with us today. Morning, Chris. Good morning, everyone. So Chris will be presenting a little bit later. And we'll get a chance to hear from her. Um, let's see, anybody else? I think that's everybody, but if I've missed you, I see Kathy Ake, although we introduced you yesterday. You're about to be up next, Kathy. Um, who else do we have? I think that might be it. So sorry if I've missed you. Um, and so with that, I'll quick look at the agenda. So we are going to be hearing from Kathy Ake next on habitat monitoring updates and, and an update on posting reports. Um, then we'll hear from Chris Temple on um, conservation efforts in Northwest Montana. And then the bulk of this morning, I think will be spent talking about um, NCDE work plan and trying to get our arms around what that historically has helped us do and then maybe get some direction there and some help um, uh, trying to outline clear priorities for 2021 and, and beyond. Um, so with that, Kathy, if you're ready, I think we'll turn to you. Hey, um, good morning. Um, hope everybody's doing well today. And I'm reporting back to this group on items um, from the fall managers meeting, specifically habitat monitoring reports and edits on specific sections of the conservation strategy document. So first off with habitat monitoring reports, um, as we kind of determined at the last uh, fall managers meeting, there are currently five reports that need to be finalized by this group before posting on the web page. Um, hopefully you all received an email on Tuesday with a zip file of those reports. My apologies, I was a bit late in sending those files out. Um, those reports have had a review or at least the opportunity for review from various specialists that provided information and or answered questions on the reports. Um, so that step has gone, has been completed. So um, we're now up to managers. Um, the final reports I'm asking about are the 2017 motorized access the 2018 and 2020 developed recreation 
and the 2018 and uh, 2020 grazing reports. Um, at this time, as people kind of want to know, hang on a second, I lost my mouse between three screens. Um, at this time, those reports and what's reported in there, um, all the standards and guidelines are being met. Um, I should add that there is, I'm starting to notice for some of these that there is um, some decision space for some of the agencies. Um, what I mean by decision space is where the agency has dropped below a baseline and at some time in the future is able to increase back up to that baseline. As an example, um, a rental cannon might have burned in some of these major fires we've had, which drops their number of sites per BMU. And the decision space is that the agency can rebuild that rental cabin anywhere in that same BMU. Um, so that's what I mean by decision space. So there's various questions that I need answered from the managers. And first off, are there any questions on any of these reports? Yes, no. Yeah, Kathy, I just want to take a minute to say thanks for doing these. You've done these all the way back to the Amendment 19 days. And frankly, my biggest fear is when you choose not to do them anymore, hopefully you've mentored someone that has the technical ability to do what you've been doing because it's critical data. Hey, thanks for that. Um, I've been told I can't retire until I download what's up here. So is there any other questions? Okay, so then the next exciting question is, I need an okay from the managers um, before we post these on the NCDE webpage. So is there any problem with posting these from the managers? Anybody have a problem? I'm good to go, Kathy. Thanks, Bill. It looks like you got a thumbs up from BLM. Um, and I think the way we were looking at this and particularly the way we were hoping to have a good approach to this is so that we don't bind you up is making sure that the managers have a chance to review those reports. And I know you've worked behind the scenes to make sure that they were seeing those. Um, so one, one last call from any of the managers if you have concerns with those being posted. All right, thanks, Kathy. Okay, um, so uh, I will get those to Dylan to get posted on the web page. Um, the other uh, next one is if you've probably noticed the 2019 monetized motorized access report is not complete. Um, outside of the subunits shared by GN Glacier National Park and Blackfeet, all the other subunits are done. Um, we had some technical glitches with the Blackfeet GIS road layer. Um, that layer just got finished. So the attributes and the GIS locations of the roads are uh, done, but they're waiting for a review. Um, I expect to have that completed within a month so that 2019 monitoring, uh, motorized access monitoring report will go out for review from the specialists. And then I will get um, the managers to have a final okay on it before posting at the fall meeting um, in November or December. So just a heads up on that one, we're still working on it. Um, like I said, it had a technical glitch. Um, we did get, you don't want to go into details unless you really want to know about them. So um, if that, I'm going to move on to the actual um, kind of edits or um, updates to that conservation strategy document. The grazing section, as I reported out last fall, um, there were some um, things that we needed to correct in there for terminology as well as how we're reporting. Um, in addition, there was the very technical appendix six document. Um, which both of those have gone through a rework from import, import, blah, 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 input from the various agency specialists and a few managers. Uh, thanks to Katie Stevens for stepping in on something that was brand new to her. So um, those edits are now with Bill and Tavish to incorporate into the conservation strategy. And again, the question is, I'm assuming that you, the managers, are okay with incorporating those changes. Yes? I didn't change standards and guidelines, just terminology and um, some updates on what we're reporting. And Kathy, your volume dropped out for me. I'm not sure if it did for others as well. You might repeat that last question. Okay, so what was the last time thing that you heard? Oh, probably the last 30 seconds where it was a little bit garbled just on the your, your last request on what input. Okay, 
So um, I'll start with the um, whole conservation strategy document part. The grazing section um, of the conservation strategy um, needed uh, an update to the terminology because the various agencies don't all use um, allotments, if you will. And in addition, the very technical appendix six um, needed to have a review. And so that review has been completed. I should thank to Kate Stevens on the BLM for um, stepping in on appendix six technical on something she probably has never seen before. So thanks to her. Um, those edits, ed, excuse me, those edits are now with Dylan um, to be incorporated into the conservation strategy. So this is my final check with you, the managers, to make sure you're okay in incorporating those changes. So is that an, a yes from the managers? Was the volume better? Yep, heard you that time. Okay. So I'm seeing thumbs up from some Forest Service and BLM. And I, I know that those who oh, had concerns watching that back and forth were, were very much paying attention. So I think they're probably good with those edits. Okay. Any others? Not for you, Kathy. Any other folks with uh, some input? No, no concerns for me. All right, thanks, Kurt. Yeah, I think you're good to go, Kathy. And thanks for the extra effort there. I know we we made you made a strong push to to make common that terminology, and we bumped into some issues right out of the gate. So thanks for your flexibility and patience there. But I think we've got a product now that at least you can help. A little more work for folks at different stages, but one way or the other, we'll get those reports out on the grazing stuff. So thank you. Thanks again, and Dylan, you're okay to continue incorporating. So. Thanks very much for everybody's time and your cooperation on all of this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Randy, real quick before Kathy goes, just, you know, off the top of my head and Kurt Steele and I, you know, we were dealing with this this summer. I wonder if our INE committee and I don't know if Lori Roberts is on the call, I don't see, but, and Dylan, if we should uh, maybe publicly um, distill the human footprint uh, by BMU work that has occurred over the years that you do, Kathy, because Kurt and I, we both see nonstop requests for more uh, recreation and more races, cabins, mountain bike trails, you name it, with these new visitors that are moving here, particularly west of the divide. Grazing is not an issue. It's all human uh, recreation that's that's going to explode, frankly, again this summer. But I wonder if the i &E group could translate some of your data by BMU. Uh, for instance, the spotted bear cabins, uh, that kind of blew up. I got a million calls on that, not a million, but a lot. And I'm sure Kurt did too. And, and but it's, it's everything from long distance races to big mountain or wherever that human footprint, the demand for Kurt to provide those opportunities isn't going to go away. He's going to hear it nonstop. Uh, we see it too. But I wonder if there's a way the INE committee uh, subcommittee could, or group could work with you to talk about those commitments in the forest plans uh, that benefit bears. A lot of these folks have never lived with an elk, much less a bear. So anyway, I just toss that out to the group as maybe a work item in the plan, even when we get to that later. And just since you're on the call, Kathy, so, because what you do is very technical and very, it's very complex, but maybe to work to make that digestible for, for everyone, it might be a real good piece of information for, for uh, the public right now. Hey, Jim, this is Tabitha. Just to, just to clarify, you're thinking like um, for each BMU sort of summarizing how it changed, how it's uh, the numbers have changed over time kind of thing, like something. No, yeah, not, e not even that deep, just that, you know, how, how that human footprint has been monitored and tracked using these databases and GIS and these reporting techniques over the years and why, um, you know, there isn't a desire to increase that footprint in, in this case, it's grizzly bears, but there's a whole bunch of other wildlife species that these new residents are gonna be dealing with. Um, yeah, just kind of start square one. And what Kathy does, you know, Tabitha, as you know, it's pretty, pretty complex. It's, most people don't even know what GIS is, but uh, you know, how, we, how we track that and why it's important. Why, why were those standards put into forest plans in the first place? And that would involve the INE folks to describe that and, and Kathy and, and Tabitha, some of the technical team to you know, emphasize the key points. I think that's going to be important because I know Kurt probably got hundreds of calls 
and and that's not going to go away. The demand to provide that all sorts of crazy opportunities on the forest is just going to grow, is my guess. Yeah, we definitely have not seen a uh, decrease in demand, and so. Jim, I do think you're on to something um, in terms of just being up front, but um, yeah, I mean, the population uh, that we're seeing in the Flathead Valley is increasing, and I think just in Montana in general is increasing, and yeah, we're going to continue to see recreation demand um, substantially increase, not stay the same. <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree, and I think that data Kathy has is really useful, and and. Uh, it's wonderful that we've that you've done this all these years, Kathy. Might as well use it uh, publicly too. Okay, I'll reach out to the INE committee and uh, see what um, can be done. Thanks, Kathy. You're you're used to me uh, at saying explain this like I'm a third grader because I <laughs> am kind of like a third grader in this stuff. So I'll uh, this will be maybe a fun little project we can work on together. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, great suggestion, Jim. Thanks for bringing it up. Okay, so thank you very much, Kathy, for your for your work and for those updates and for getting that stuff posted so folks can, can track all that good work. And um, I think let's shift now to Chris Temple um, and her presentation of Bear Walks Through It, 20 Years of Habitat Conservation in Northwest Montana. Chris? Thanks, Randy, and thanks everybody for having me. Um, yeah, I'm going to give a little presentation. Let me get it up here. Okay, everybody can see that hopefully. Um, so what I want to talk about, obviously, as Randy said, is habitat conservation that we've been doing in Northwest Montana for the last 20 years and kind of talk about what that's meant for grizzly bears, but a whole bunch of other species as well, and also for public recreation, and then kind of give you the brief lowdown on what's been happening the last year plus with all the ownership changes here in Northwest Montana and how that's going to affect things in the future. And so I want to kind of start back at the beginning. So Fish, Wildlife and Parks has been in the business of protecting fish and wildlife habitat and uh, providing recreation for people for a very long time. Our first state park was created in 1935 and that was the Lewis and Clark Caverns. Um, our first habitat conservation was started in the 1940s and that was the Sun River and Judith River and Gallatin um, wildlife management areas. And their focus was really on protecting critical winter range for deer and elk and different species like that. And that kind of conservation continued through 1987 using primarily federal funding like Pittman Robertson and state license dollars. But then in 1987, House Bill 526 passed and Habitat Montana was created. And that really allowed more conservation to happen because it was a portion of hunter license dollars that was now going to fund conservation. 92% um, of it was coming from non-residents. It's about five to $6 million a year, sometimes more. There's also a maintenance fund that's associated with that. And the priority habitats for that are usually wetlands and intermountain grasslands and shrub grasslands. And it really prioritized doing conservation easements and not acquisitions. And so I just want to make sure I know this group probably knows all this, but I always go through this anyway. Well, what is a conservation easement? It's a voluntary legal agreement between a landowner and a land trust or a government agency like Fish, Wildlife and Parks that limits certain uses of the land in perpetuity to protect conservation values that we care about. And as far as FWP, our easements really focus on protecting vital fish and wildlife habitat while retaining that working landscape and maintaining open space and allowing that public recreational access. So we're really trying to prevent development, but allow those private landowners to continue doing what they're doing as long as it, it benefits fish and wildlife. And so here's the, all the different species that, you know, obviously we care about here are the bull trout, the West Slope cutthroat trout, non-game species like toads. We have our grizzly bears, of course, and moose and deer and elk, uh, antelope on the other side of the divide. 
And so I want to talk a little bit about Region 1 and what we've been doing. And we're really lucky here in Region 1 that we had a settlement with Bonneville Power Administration back in the late 80s that provided mitigation due to wildlife habitat loss due to Hungry Horse and Libby Dams. And it created a wildlife mitigation program within Region 1, which is where I work as a habitat conservation biologist. And those people, it was a settlement for about $12.5 million. And that really wasn't enough to fully mitigate all the habitat that was lost behind those dams. But luckily, Alan Wood and Gail Bissell were forward thinking enough and they decided, you know what, we'll use our staff time and bring dollars from other places using federal dollars and stuff to really stretch all this and work with partners to make conservation a priority here in region one. And definitely working with partners was a huge part of it. The trust for public land and local land trusts have been a huge part of the conservation we've been able to accomplish over the last 20 years. And so a couple of the federal programs that we use is one of the main ones that has funded most of our conservation here is the Forest Legacy Program from the US Forest Service. And that's a program that wants to keep um, forests from converting to non-forest uses. And it was really started in the Northeast where they didn't have all the national forests that we have here. But now it's a program that's throughout the country and every state and territory is part of it except North Dakota. And it's a really highly competitive program, but our uh, applications do really well every year because we have just such a fabulous resource here in Montana. And another program that we use all the time is the US Fish and Wildlife Service Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund, which protects federally listed species. And so we have a lot of those too as well. So we've really been able to use that. And those programs all require at least 25% match and most of that has either come from private funding through foundations and different uh, funding partners like that, but um, it's also come from below market sales a lot from our uh, landowners who are willing to do this and a little bit too from our Habitat Montana program. We do use that as well for match. So let's go back to where we started back in the 1990s. So this is kind of a, a generalization of what the what it looked like back in the 90s. We had Glacier National Park, we had all the forest land, um, we had the reservation, but then we had all this white land in between here that you can see between the NCDE and the Cabinet Yak. And um, this was mostly Plum Creek timberland at the time, but um, our, Alan Wood and other people in our mitigation program realized that even though this is timberland right now, it's kind of, it's open to the public, it's providing good wildlife habitat, you know, this could get sold, this might not be like this forever. And so they started working on conservation easements. And so the first conservation easement was completed in the early 2000s, and that was with Plum Creek Timber Company. And uh, the Trust for Public Land was our partner to help us make this happen. And it protected over 142,000 acres in the Thompson Fisher. And it was mainly to protect low elevation winter range, but there's also obviously grizzly bears in this area. Um, and so the next one after that, in the, about the mid 2000s, we moved over to the Swan Valley and we're focusing on this area. And we did a conservation easement that was just over 9,000 acres and also a fee acquisition of about 600 acres. And this was actually part of the larger project of the Montana Legacy Project, which protected over 320,000 acres of turned former Plum Creek timberland into DNA in our sea land and some of it was purchased by the Nature Conservancy. So this was a really large project that we were part of. And then in about 2012, we started working with Stimson Lumber Company to protect scattered parcels around Troy. And this was the Kootenai Valley's conservation easement that protected 28,000 acres. And then um, in the mid 2010s, we were working with um, the Stoltz Land and Lumber Company, who wanted to do a conservation easement just north of Whitefish and also outside of Columbia Falls. This is the Haskell Basin and Trumbull Creek conservation easements. And around that same time, Warehouser also wanted to do a conservation easement around here. It was actually Plum Creek who wanted to do a conservation easement around here in this part of the Stillwater. It's a hole in the Stillwater State Forest that had been owned by the Timber Company for over 100 years. And um, in the meantime, while we're working on this conservation easement, 
uh, Plum Creek sold all their land to Weyerhaeuser and Weyerhaeuser was really new to conservation at the time and didn't feel comfortable with the conservation easement, but said they would sell the property outright. And so they ended up wanting to sell it and we brought all the funding to it and uh, it actually became DNRC land. DNRC became the owner and we hold a conservation easement on the DNRC land. And so this was a really important piece of property here, especially in the Haskell Basin. It protected um, the drinking water supply for the city of Whitefish, along with obviously timber and elk winter range, and there's grizzly bears all over these properties. This is a picture of the Whitefish Lake Watershed Project, which is in the upper corner there is Swift Creek, which is bull trout habitat. And there are trumpeter swans that are now in on this property, thanks to restoration efforts from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And here's a little schematic of all the grizzly bears that we were showing that we're using this property. It's huge, especially in the spring, but obviously connectivity between Glacier National Park and down into the lower valley and parts down there. And then in 2019, fairly recently, we were working again with Stimson Lumber Company to do the Kootenai Forest Lands Conservation Easement, which was just over 22,000 acres of scattered parcels around Libby. And here's Pipe Creek, a really important bull trout habitat. And here's grizzly bears on this property. Um, this is provided by our FWP staff and also by Wayne Caseworm. He's been great providing us all sorts of data. And here's some of the connectivity from the Proctor et al. Uh, research that was done that shows how important this is. And the connectivity actually goes all the way up into Canada and everything. And us being able to show how important this is for grizzly bears and that connectivity, you know, not just between the NCDE and the Cabinet Yak and all the way over to the Selkirks, but up into Canada really helps with our forest legacy applications and that international connection. And so by the end of 2019, quite a bit of this, what I had been showing as white is now protected. And so the purple is all conservation easements held and managed by Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And the red is conservation easements held by different land trusts. And so last year we were able to complete the Lost Trail Conservation Easement, which is adjacent to the Lost Trail National Wildlife Refuge. It's the north slope of Dredger Ridge, which is a really important elk hunting area. And we had been working on this with Weyerhaeuser. And here's Doll Lake and uh, Dredger Ridge in the background. And just a really important connectivity area. We were showing how it can connects the NCDE here with the Cabinet Yak. Here's a bunch of grizzly bear locations moving through this area. Um, there's also an elk herd that moves through here, a migratory elk herd that comes from the reservation and moves up just northwest of Whitefish. And then there's also a resident herd here as well. So this is really important. And while we were working on this project, Weyerhaeuser announced that they were going to sell all of their land in Montana to Southern Pine Plantation. And so we were like, oh no, what is this going to mean? But luckily, Southern Pine wanted to do conservation and it has been really great to work with. And so Jim Williams made sure he got the owner, this is Benji Griffith, um, out there. And this is one of the guys that works with him, Eric Moody, uh, out to see a grizzly bear and actually get to touch it. So that was really huge. And he got to understand the importance of all the land they had just bought. And so by the end of 2020, with the completion of the Lost Trail Conservation Easement, we've protected just over 230,000 acres of public recreation access and valuable fish and wildlife habitat. And so now what's the future? Well, we are currently working on another conservation easement with Stimson Lumber Company, which is going to tie into the existing Thompson Fisher Conservation Easement and do the upper reaches of the Fisher here. This is the Kootenai Forest Lands Phase Two conservation project, which is just over 27,000 acres of just fabulous forest land. Just a really beautiful piece of property. Um, there's moose on there that are collared that we've been studying. Um, so that's one of the projects we're working on. The other project that we're working on is actually an acquisition, which we haven't done very many of those. Obviously, I've been talking about mostly conservation easements, but this is a piece of property that is owned by the Columbia Falls Aluminum Company. 
and they had an aluminum plant just across the river over here and they bought this just over um, almost 800 acres of property to buffer the aluminum plant and they never used it for anything. So even though the aluminum plant was declared a super fun site a couple of years ago, this property was not part of it. And we and partners that have been working to protect the Flathead Valley and the Flathead River had been eyeing this piece of property for 20 years. And luckily we had been in contact with the aluminum company and Glencore who actually owns it. Uh, and when they decided that they were gonna, you know, tear down the plant and this was gonna become a super fun site, but this property wasn't part of it. They apart, approached us and partners and said, hey, would you be interested in purchasing this property from us? And we said, absolutely. You can see the connectivity here between the Whitefish Range and down into the Flathead Valley and over to the Swan Range and even into Glacier National Park. It's just a fabulous piece of property. Here's some of the, the wetlands on the property. There are grizzly bears all over it here and it has been open through our block management program to youth hunting for several years now and is very popular for the being right next to the city of Columbia Falls like it is. And here's a youth hunter out looking for some elk and finding some grizzly bear tracks. And as you can see from here, here's grizzly bears. These, the green dots are grizzly bears moving between the Whitefish Range and the uh, Swan Mountains and also all on the property. We find them there all the time. The yellow dots are actually bull trout uh, radio telemetry that we have of them using this for overwintering. They also migrate past here. They rear and they you know, are adults in Flathead Lake and then they go and spawn in the north and middle forks of the Flathead River and go all the way up into Canada, but they migrate right past this property. So that's a really exciting piece of property that we're working on. And so into the future, we, there's even more conservation going on, which is really exciting. This uh, blue line here with the hashes through it is what the US Fish and Wildlife Service just approved. It's the Lost Trail Conservation Area where they are now approved to do conservation easements with willing landowners within this footprint here. And the yellow is what we are calling our Montana Great Outdoors Project. Just uh, two years ago, the, uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund was per permanently refunded and permanently, permanently funded and permanently reauthorized. And that allowed the Forest Legacy Program to provide more funding than ever has been available. It used to be a $7 million cap for each project. Now it's up to $20 million. So this is in yellow here is 130,000 acres. And we were able to put in for a full $20 million grant from Forest Legacy last year. We still haven't heard, but we're very hopeful that we're going to do really well. Um, so that is a project we're working on. And as we were working on this, um, as you can see here, here's the Thompson Chena Lakes uh, and the fabulous habitat around that more of this habitat here. This is actually Island Lake, which is in that Lost Trail conservation area that the US Fish and Wildlife Service is working on. And so there's been some rapidly changing land ownership. And as I was saying, while we were working on this project and while the Fish and Wildlife Service was working on their project, we found out that Green Diamond was going to be buying almost 300,000 acres of warehouser land. And so we were wondering what that was gonna mean, but luckily Green Diamond, one of the things they said right off the bat is one of the reasons they were interested in buying this land in Montana is because all this conservation is happening. So it's really gonna allow them to continue to own and manage this land long-term, but get some money up front because a lot of it's really pretty heavily logged and it's gonna need some time to recover. And so having conservation easements on here and some money up front is really going to allow them to be in it for the for the long term around here. And so here is the latest ownership in Northwest Montana. Uh, this kind of darker blue is Stimson, which really hasn't changed. The orange is what SPP still owns, Southern Pine Plantation. The green here is now Green Diamond property, which they also own the Lost Trail Conservation easement now. And then the purple here is owned by uh, Mark Jones, who is building a house in Whitefish and is a billionaire from Texas and originally from Lethbridge, but he has also, we have been in touch with him. So hopefully he will also wanna do conservation in the future 
And here's kind of our conservation thrown onto the ownership map now. So here's the, the Thompson Fisher, the, the uh, black here with the hashes through it are the conservation easements that are completed already. And so here's the blue with Stimson that we're working on in that purple area that I was saying that is the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, conservation area, which is now gonna be partially with SPP and partially with Green Diamond, which is the same case for our Montana Great Outdoors project. But luckily, even though this is all changed why we're working through it from Weyerhaeuser to SPP to Green Diamond, all these projects are still in the works and still moving forward. So it's very exciting. And it's also been a really great way to start to interact with these new landowners that we have this really, this good nexus. And our partner, the Trust for Public Land has been instrumental in making sure that the, you know, everybody who comes to the table knows about the opportunities that are here, including block management so that we can continue to have um, hunting and fishing access. And then our conservation easements also provide year round recreation access. And so here is Jim Williams getting ahead of everything and meeting with Mark Jones and showing him, you know, uh, talking about his property and all the benefits of his property and how awesome it is for fish and wildlife and getting him excited about that, which he is. So we're hopeful that um, we know he's going to do block management. He's keeping his property open now for the public as long as they stay respectful and uh, hopefully he'll do a conservation easement in the future but that remains to be seen. So that's kind of a down and dirty of how much everything has changed around here in the last year or so and then also all the conservation we've been able to accomplish over the last 20 years and with that I will uh, take questions. So um, I guess I'm, I'm just floored, Chris. Um, I was going to, I guess I was going to start with, well, was that all? <laughs> That's um, it. That's all we're done. <laughs> is that it? Okay. Well, you know, we all have things we're working on, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, just, just a remarkable presentation. And I think that's the first time I've seen it all in one place with, the uh, the timeline as well, just to show, mm -hmm. um, with, you know, Alan before you, and then now under your watchful eye and the help of other partners in region one, it's just amazing the attention to the landscape. And even though it's continually changing in the ownership, your, your guys's vision hasn't changed at all. And, and your fidelity to that vision is just remarkable and your ability to keep your energy up through those changes. So man, just super impressive. And, and I guess it makes me really, really glad that we have people focused on this because we all have busy lives and to know that it's your your commitment and the commitment of your team up there is just remarkable. So I see some, uh, at least one hand up right now, uh, Katie. Hey, Chris, um, does Fish, Wildlife and Parks do conservation easements that are just for habitat conservation or is there always an access and recreation component to them? Yeah, uh, definitely it's different in different parts of the state as well. Um, we usually have some access, usually at least for hunting and fishing or, or just hunting, it depends. Like especially in Eastern Montana, a lot of times it's private ranches, so it's very different. Here in Northwest Montana, we kind of kept it as um, these timber companies already had open lands policies and they were already allowing recreation and we just kind of memorialized what they had been doing. So it kind of made sense. And um, we were really lucky that we did that because people had kind of always thought of, I think a lot of the timber company land as de facto almost forest service land or something like that. And they just kind of expected it. But obviously with all these changes now in different ownerships, they are realizing that isn't necessarily the case. But you know, fish, wildlife and parks, a lot of our conservation, especially when we're using Habitat Montana funding, it's really to protect habitat and recreation is something they want as well and especially hunting access but you know it it's not the focus but it, it usually fo you know factors into most of our easements but uh, region one's a little bit different for the most part in just because of the timber companies that we were working with the landowners the landowners always have to be willing to do whatever you know we agree to so every easement's a little bit different thank you 
Yeah, Chris, I think you said it before, but I, I just want to circle back to it that this, these for sure, because it's kind of a common confusion sometimes, these main t remain privately owned and those property owners continue to pay property taxes, correct? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. And could you also talk a little bit about, you know, another reason this has been able to happen is the Forest Legacy Program has ranked many of these projects like top three or top five in the nation, correct? Could you just talk a little bit about how not only do we think this is pretty cool up here in Northwest Montana, but nationally these projects have stood out as like the gold standard. Is, am I uh, being a little hyperbolic there or no? No, absolutely. We've had number one projects. Our um, Trumbull Creek project, our Haskell Basin project, we're all number one. I think everything's been at least in the top 10. Most of them have been in the top five. Um, we just do really well. They have the criteria of, you know, how threatened is it? Uh, how is it strategic? And what is the importance? And the importance has to do with threatened and endangered species. It has to do with um, just other species habitat. It also has to do with recreation or cultural reasons. So there's a whole slew of things. And like I said, they do look at this at a national level and you're competing against, you know, 50 other projects, sometimes more than that. So, because um, states can have more than one project. They can have up to three projects. So um, for us to consistently rank in the top and to get full funding all the time that we ask for for our projects is just amazing. And uh, the Forest Legacy Program just loves our projects because not only do we apply for the funding, we get them done. And we get them done the year that the money is appropriated and that's huge. And a lot of that has to do with us having staff, luckily in region one in our mitigation program that has time like me to just focus on this and to actually be able to do that. You know, So our mitigation program has really afforded something that um, is benefiting a lot of people and, um, and species and habitat. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, and one quick follow-up question, if that's all right, Randy. Um, these require obviously local support, right? What, what could you talk a little bit about how it's not just us that are talking about how beneficial this is? You, you have to go to county commissioners, right? And, and sportsman's groups and, and get a lot of input, right? Yeah, definitely. Our, um, conservation easements, we always have to do an environmental assessment. They go out to the public, we take public comment. You know, and 20 years ago, people didn't really understand conservation easements or what the what they meant. And a lot of people are always confused that it comes off the tax rolls or, you know, they don't realize that it stays in private hands and we just make sure that it doesn't get developed. And, um, Way back when, even the county commissioners, for the most part, weren't necessarily supportive, but that has changed so much over time. Every um, Our last conservation easement, that Montana Great Outdoors project, is actually in Sanders, Lincoln, and Flathead County, and all three county commissioners, uh, commission boards, so all, you know, nine people supported this project. So that is really huge. And then, like, our Bad Rock Canyon project in that's just outside of the city of Columbia Falls, the city, the mayor, and all the council members are supportive of that. And really the public has really come around and has been very supportive. And I think a lot of people just didn't, didn't really think about it too much, but especially in the last year or so with all these lands selling and everything, they're realizing what they could lose for public access. And um, our conservation easements are now getting tons of comments all in support and it's a lot of hunters and fishers and and obviously conservation minded people and everything who always were on in support but now it's really kind of changed and it's across the political divide of you know everybody is pretty excited about all these projects we're working on which is kind of neat to see all the support that fish wildlife and parks is getting for our projects now great and thanks for the follow-up questions, Dylan. Any other questions from anybody else? Well, thanks, Chris, for joining us today and giving us that update. And um, like Dylan mentioned yesterday, the presentations that are here, we'll make sure that our presenters have those available and we can post that on the site so people can follow these projects. And hats off to you and, and all of our partners up there in Region 1. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Yeah, thanks, everybody. So taking a quick look at our agenda, um, 
we're, we're ahead of schedule a few minutes and I thought we might take advantage of that right now and just take a quick break. Um, so if everybody's good with that, why don't we take a 15 minute break? Um, I had a one call I need to make, so it'll be perfect timing for me. And then let's reconvene at 10 o'clock and we'll finish up the rest of our morning's agenda. Thanks everybody.
All right, welcome back everyone. For those, for those of you who may have missed it, we were on break for a couple minutes there and um, we're now gonna kick, pick back up in our agenda. Um, our next item, which is broadly being described as NCDE work plan review and 2021 priorities. And I thought it would be helpful. Um, we'll, we'll dive into this with a, quite a bit more detail, but our aim here was to have a more intentional conversation around our work plan and what we've identified for 2021. But I think you'll see as we start to have this conversation that there's an interest in, um, in spending some time on our actual work plan to make sure that it's guiding the NCDE um, productively and, and able to, to help us all understand what things we should be working on and then maybe drive some energy around some particularly high priorities that we wanna make sure that we can be focused on. And just a little bit of background now, I'm, I might provide some later as well, but when I first started attending NCDE meetings, um, it was evident that the, the huge benefit of just being collaborative and coordinating um, a couple times of year and was was evident. And that was just as such an, uh, an easy low hanging fruit benefit of the NCDE getting together. And then the, the influence and in working together around the conservation strategies and setting standards and those accountability that comes with that. And then each agency with their own requirements and underlying regulatory measures that they've put in place. And so with time, you get a familiarity that the NCDE also has this big machine behind the scenes a little bit. And it wasn't until a few years into it that I started to recognize that this work plan and the work plan priorities was a really good tracking mechanism. Um, when I became chair, it became evident to me that I had responsibilities for not only looking at that work plan, but reporting the outcomes of that work plan to the interagency grizzly bear committee. And if nothing else, it serves as a collection point for what we're doing and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but I'll, we'll, we'll return to that with a, with a glance at that work plan and some specifics in it. Um, but I wanted to start first with giving Dylan a chance on um, information education outreach updates and the connection to IGBC. And so with that, Dylan, if you wanna um, give your update and then we can start turning towards um, other elements of that work plan. Sounds good, thanks Randy. Um, yeah, I just have a, a relatively short presentation I will go through uh, right now. Uh, can everybody, can you see that, Randy? Yep, we're good. Okay, so um, yeah, as Randy mentioned, a big part of the work plan, a big part of IGBC, and then these subcommittees is uh, the information, education, and outreach component and efforts, because um, those obviously play a role in everything we're trying to do here. Um, in big and small ways. And so uh, just a little quick background, you know, each of these uh, ecosystem subcommittees also have uh, sub subcommittees of information, education and outreach groups or teams. Uh, this is your NCDE subcommittee uh, that obviously is gonna be changing a little bit with Lynn Johnson retiring and then uh, Whisper, uh, I'm gonna have to chat with her to see if she's gonna have time to serve on this one in her new role, uh, but um, yeah, we, uh, I think we're going to recruit uh, Dave Hagengruber, who I want to virtually introduce to everybody. He is our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Region 4 Information and Education Program Manager now. So he's my counterpart, and he'll uh, be doing a great job up there in Region 4, and I'm going to try to twist his arm into joining us on this subcommittee. And, uh, and then we have Lori Roberts, who is the chair of the IGBC Information Education and Outreach Committee. So lots of uh, efforts and people involved at different levels in the IE and O stuff. And so um, if any of you or your staff, uh, looking at you subcommittee members, have anybody who you think would be good to have on this subcommittee, I'm always looking to uh, increase uh, the membership here. Um, and really the primary task, so please let me know, I guess, if you have anybody uh, in mind. The primary task um, of our subcommittee, IEO you know, subcommittees, uh, really has been to identify or, or to seek applications for grants that help others do IEO you know, work. And so realizing that 
all of the land management agencies and us at Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the tribes and everybody who's trying to work on grizzly bear conservation and recovery uh, is doing everything they can. We need to try to empower others, especially uh, NGOs, to do some of that work out on the landscape and in their communities. And so these grants are, are really intended to help uh, enhance these efforts. And so you can see this was the last year's, our, our latest grant uh, awardees. Um, we always get lots of great applications uh, from agencies, but also from NGOs. And, uh, and so we do our best uh, with a relatively small pot of money to spread out those funds and help uh, engage uh, you know, organizations and efforts. So you can kind of see from this list, it's a, it's a pretty good wide array. We, uh, the one that I was really excited about was this new one. It was a new one from Sealy Lake School District and trying to, to develop uh, kind of a school program about bear awareness. And so uh, that's been an idea that's been floating around for a long time. And then to see the school district bring it up, we, we thought it was awesome. So we were happy to support that one. Um, Swan Valley Connections, who does lots of great work uh, with um, education outreach. And then uh, the Forest Service, uh, different supplies and needs and materials. And, and really some of these, I, I think, help identify that oftentimes uh, these materials and supplies here at FWP or in other places can sometimes fall through the cracks when you're trying to fund them. And so uh, those costs can add up pretty quickly. And so these grants help uh, try to uh, cover those things that uh, are important for our bear rangers, for our staff, um, and then Glacier Institute is really doing a great job for anybody who's been following uh, their work under their new executive director, uh, Anthony. He is really trying to increase their education programming at the Glacier Institute in Columbia Falls. Um, and so a big component of that that Anthony's really interested in is bear education. And so they are really stepping up uh, and putting out some really great programming on bear education. So we were happy to support them with an IEO grant. And then Glacier National Park is there uh, dealing with this huge influx of visitors uh, bear education is, is as important, if not more important than ever, as we have more people going into the park. So um, the, the, the grant program is really critical uh, part of what we do and our subcommittees review applications and we have good discussions going through each and every one of these to try to determine where we can try to uh, send our support. Um, and so we will be going through another round uh, at the end of this year, although uh, that might be changing the time frame as far as when we open up applications and then and go through that review process. It sounds like that might be changing a little bit, but we always advertise that on the IGBC website and then try to get out news releases as best we can to get people aware of that to put in for grants. Um, so this is a new uh, thing I wanted to make everybody aware of. So Fish, Wildlife and Parks, we have done a huge uh, redesign and redevelopment of our website. And um, I've been working with our webmaster and, and a couple other staff uh, in Helena to get that uh, old website kind of updated and merged over into this new one. And so the, the one that I kind of spent a lot of time on here recently was getting this grizzly bear site developed. And so I wanted to make everybody aware of that because with any new website, you gotta learn how to navigate it. So I wanted to just take a quick minute and, and surf through this so people are aware uh, about all the information and resources about grizzly bears. So, um, you go to our main Fish, Wild, Land, Park site uh, and you go, so here's fwp.mt.gov under conservation. And then you scroll down and this conservation page is intended to be where everything about our management and conservation uh, efforts are gonna be found. So you can see here's bears right here, but also uh, this top thing is gonna change every once in a while with kind of seasonally relevant information. But here is kind of species management and research. Um, and so there you go, bears, and the goal is for this to be a one-stop shop for everything you're looking for, for bear inf information about grizzly bears and black bears, uh, including here's safety messaging. Um, you can go here and we've got lots of videos. Um, I know right now it's pretty uh, text heavy. Uh, we're, once we kind of have a chance to catch our breath, we're gonna look at ways to try to break this up uh, to make it a little less dense, but there's just lots of good important information as everybody knows that we're trying to get across to people. So we've broken it up into kind of individual activities, recreating, camping, hunting, angling, uh, biking, agriculture, living with bears, and then 
uh, encounters. And so, like I said, lots of information. Uh, this isn't a finished product, but for now it's all at least in one place. Um, management and conservation. This one's important for anybody who's wanting to know about uh, or looking for our latest uh, research and management reports. Um, so we've got lots of links here to US Fish and Wildlife Service resources as well. Uh, information about the recovery zones, uh, our management plans. And then here's where the annual reports are, which I know folks are always looking for the latest versions of those. So um, this is where we'll be posting, like for example, we've got Tim Manley's uh, 2020 report right here that you can download. We got Kim's report from Cabinet Yak and then Wesley's report from Region 4. And as we get more reports, we'll be filling those in here. And these reports for anybody who knows is just filled, filled with lots of great information, a lot of IEO stuff as well. You know, how many uh, electric fences Tim and Justine put up, you know, all kinds of great information uh, about our day to day in the field management efforts are in these reports. And then down here, we've got information about conflict response. Um, and then here's some, uh, another great section. And this has a lot to do with, you know, Cecily and Lori's great work on research and monitoring. And so all of Cecily's reports, like she mentioned yesterday, those all live right here. And so um, you can find all the reports right here under annual reports and then information about greater Yellowstone. You know, you can get a link to the interagency grizzly bear study team website and then cabinet yak. Here's a little shout out about IGBC and then some stuff on black bears. So you can see the goal and then here's bear ID knowing about making sure you know the difference between grizzly bear and black bear. Um, so you can see the goal is to have everything you want to know about bears on this landing page and then you can here's for you know educators and people who are looking for just fun facts about bears we've got those all listed here um hunting information for black bears and then this one's obviously important too for uh, contacts for how to get in touch with our bear managers um regardless of where you're at so just wanted to kind of do a quick little rundown uh, for anybody wondering where you can find this on our new website conservation tab up here at the top is going to be uh, the place to go for that stuff. Uh, speaking of websites, we're also still working on getting the IGBC website updated and hope to have that uh, opened uh, for, uh, I think, some bids here soon. I know that's been a long um, a project that's been long in the works and so excited to see that making some progress. Um, out of our subcommittee discussions, you know, a consistent uh, need or, or priority that we've identified is consistent messaging, particularly involving signs. Um, you know, there's lots of different signs out there and lots of different brochures and, and, and sometimes that can kind of um, muddy the, the messaging a little bit. So we've taken a real uh, concerted effort at identifying just consistent messages and consistent signs for fish, wildlife, and parks. These are two of them. This one on the right, uh, the, with the Fast paced recreation signage is something we worked on and Amy Jacobs played a huge role in helping make that happen. Um, and then our, our uh, design developer in Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Amy Glasscock took our ideas and turned it into this sign that I think is really effective. And the goal now is to get the template of this sign to anybody who wants it. So uh, we're gonna post it on our Fish, Wildlife and Parks website as a, uh, an image to download. And then the IGBC website uh, with the goal being any NGOs or other agencies who want this sign can take it and use it. They can swap out their logo if they would like. Uh, you know, we'd prefer that they didn't change the messaging because that would obviously defeat the entire purpose, but they could change, you know, the, the contact information or the logo particularly, and then slap that sign up at trailheads or wherever they'd like to see it. And that way we start to build a little repetition in the messaging so that regardless of if you're gonna be on a forest service trail uh, at a Fish, Wildlife and Parks park, um, anything like that, you're going to see the same sign and you start to recognize that repetition of message. And then hopefully that starts to build some awareness and education. And then the sign on the left is uh, another bear awareness sign that is being used at some of our fishing access sites. Um, so stay tuned for uh, kind of how you can get that sign. I've already sent it out to Glacier Park and some of our other partners like Whitefish Legacy Partners to see if they'd be interested in using these. So um, hoping to see those out at a trailhead near you. Um, and then just kind of lastly, other outreach efforts that are ongoing with Fish, Wildlife and Parks, but also all of our uh, partners here. 
um, staff training, uh, Daniel Euler, who uh, is just an excellent educator uh, who deals with living with wildlife issues statewide, but primarily grizzly bears and bear education has put together some really great uh, videos and is doing staff training uh, across the state to, uh, about bear awareness um, and how to use bear spray. And so you may have seen some of these videos that are going out uh, regularly on social media. And then um, we're, we're putting out these video resources again for agencies to use for their own training purposes. Um, up here in Western Montana, we've been working with our tourism and convention bureaus to try to partner with them as they are, you know, really doing a lot of direct messaging and marketing campaigns for visitors to really try to get them to incorporate uh, bear awareness into their messaging so that uh, anybody coming to Montana should know that that Montana is bear country and that bear spray is important to carry and that other elements of being bear aware are really important to be aware of before you get here um, so that they kind of know what their expectations should be for bear country. And so I uh, really appreciate the tourism and convention bureaus, uh, particularly glacier country has really stepped up lately and they're actually in the process of looking about maybe uh, getting some funding to do uh, um, an advertising campaign that really talks about recreate responsibly and, and all the many things we're trying to get across to our visitors and our, our residents about uh, kind of the old school leave no trace principles that we've heard talked about as a need. Um, we're really trying to revive those and uh, re-emphasize those messaging, you know, leave no trace, but and a big part of that is uh, bear awareness here in Montana. So they're going to really help us carry that messaging out uh, statewide and then collaborations. Uh, lastly, you know, Lori Roberts has done an excellent job as the chair of IGBC of looking at some projects that we can really um, make our signature efforts. And one of these that's in the works right now is developing a Bear Smart community program that would um, partner with willing municipalities that are interested in, you know, being certified as a Bear Smart community, similar to the program they have in British Columbia and finding ways to really uh, enhance bear awareness and bear safety in these communities that are in bear country. Um, and so this Bear Smart program that's in the works would help identify criteria for how you would be certified as a Bear Smart community. Um, and we've got some examples of this already across the state. Um, and we've had great presentations in, uh, uh, about those and what's working and, and how to do this and how to really encourage municipalities to get on board with this. And so um, I believe Lori said the goal is to bring uh, this draft program idea to the IGBC executive committee at the winter meeting. So uh, between now and then we're going to fine tune this a little bit more. And I'm really excited though about this project as a way to really ingrain bear awareness into our uh, municipalities and, and really find partners through them and in these efforts. Uh, I'm probably forgetting something. So, so Lori, if I forgot something, chime in. But otherwise, um, I think that is it on just kind of a rundown of information education and outreach efforts. Um, and although this has the FWP logo on it, don't be confused. This is involving our, our Forest Service partners, our tribal partners, National Park Service, everybody. This has all been a big team effort. So I just happen to have the FWP PowerPoint slide. Great, thanks Dylan. Um, trying to think what's easiest next. So first, I guess one thing that popped up into my mind was just the, as we talk about NCDE priorities and work plan, um, for those of you who have been paying attention, the, the IGBC um, information and education subcommittee is relatively new um, and it came out of an interest by IGBC and the subcommittees to, to find or to normalize or, or find consistency across all of the ecosystems and the subcommittees uh, with messaging and the rest. So if there's pieces that Lori can speak to as the chair of that IGBC, I think that'll come into this in our prioritization work as we're talking next. But um, thanks Dylan for, for that update. And I think we'll turn next to um, 
Hillary and Lori to talk about the mortality subcommittee discussion. And we'll see how that blends then into our 21, uh, 2021 priorities. So Hillary and Lori. Thanks, Randy. And there's Lori. Great. So um, thanks, Dylan. That was, uh, um, that was great to hear. And um, I, your website's all pretty awesome. We're trying to still work on ours. Uh, we have some more updates to do. Um, so yeah, for this agenda item, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me get up there. Lori and I um, went through, wait a minute, I can't do two things at once. I need to share, <laughs> I need to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Share. Okay. So um, for those of you that were, were around um, the last, I guess a couple of years ago, um, you probably remember us talking a lot about this conflict and mortality review. Um, it originated from the IGBC executive committee. We did a PowerPoint mostly with data from the NCDE and the GYE looking at trends in conflict and mortality over time. And uh, the chair at that time, Matt Hogan, assigned the subcommittees a task to do a big review of conflict and mortality, kind of come up with some priority areas and, and then implement some plans on how to address these things. Um, we had a working group, uh, kind of a small NCDE working group, and we reviewed all of the data. I'm not gonna go through that now. We don't have that much time, but... Um, yeah, I think Lori compiled all of the data over the last 10 years, and we came up with these priority issues. Um, and it was, you know, we, we just chose to, shoot, to lump some of these things into shooting related, there's different kinds of shooting related mortalities and conflicts. Auto hey, Hillary, you're, you're sharing the wrong screen. You're sharing your, your oh. uh, screen or something. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. That's funny. <laughs> Or I guess if you go to display, oh, okay, never mind. Dylan, try again. switch it. Yeah, if you just click display settings and then I think either mirror or, or duplicate, then that should do it. Well, you see that? Yep, and then if you go down to presentation, yep, click that one. Okay. And there we go. Yeah, there you go. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so we came up with these four priority issues based on the data, the review of data. And we had some um, recommendations for each one of those, but also uh, the team came up with overarching recommendations. I didn't know this was um, formatted this way. So I'm sorry about the colors. <laughs> I'm just going to say that right off the bat. Um, we wanted to just, we just kind of decided to color code it for just to make it easy to, to understand. So the working group came up with two kind of overarching recommendations. And the first one is this idea to establish some long-term working groups. Um, you know, the, these are not issues that we can just, you know, do a quick fix. They're going to need some longer term groups. Um, as part of that, we recommended, um, you know, making sure we got the right people in the group, including some reps from external groups or industries where it would be relevant. I mean, there's a lot of other people besides the agencies that sit on the subcommittee that are involved in these things. Um, we also came up with a bigger overarching recommendation to coordinate strategies among ecosystems, recognizing that, you know, a lot of ecosystems are dealing with the same types of conflict. So Lori and I got together a few times and kind of um, reviewed what we know has happened uh, and tried to say, point out, um, you know, what things are we good on, what things have been accomplished what's kind of ongoing or kind of in the works and things that really have done a good job addressing already. And so that's the kind of the color coding. Um, green is, hey, we've done a good job addressing this already or it's taken care of. 
yellow is an ongoing issue. And then the red ones are things that um, we need to think a little bit more about and are, or, or I, we haven't thought about whatsoever. So that's just to give you an idea, that's kind of what, how we uh, uh, went through this thing. So, you know, yesterday, I'll work through these top down out of working groups and maybe adding extra representatives. Um, Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee is currently, they've identified the same thing. So they're trying to figure that out. You know, there's, there's some just basic questions about how would that work? How do you, you know, you don't want a hundred people on a working group. There might, if you have a hundred people interested, you can't have everybody efficiently working together. So how, how do you do that? So that's one point. We'll see what they came up with. Um, but yesterday, I think it was George, you know, he brought this point up in, you know, okay, but what happens when you have other groups with different political agendas? Sounds like there is some concern about that, that, you know, maybe is worth discussing. Just wanted to bring it up to the subcommittee or remind them of that issue. But also, you know, it's, we were thinking, you know, there's, a, there's more than just other groups. Uh, there's a lot of private individuals that might have expertise or be interested in helping. So we we hope that the, you know, we just, I guess we wanted to point that out. And, and when we're talking about how do we add extra people or groups, um, think about those things. Uh, let's see, then the coordinate strategies. This is something IGBC is considering right now. And we're, it's kind of an ongoing discussion. Uh, there, there's widespread recognition that yeah, you know, we have the same issues going on. Uh, Lori's an example of that with the INE subcommittee, that it's, it's a newish subcommittee, it's overarching. And so, um, yeah, yeah, Lori, speak up if, if you want to point anything specific out. Yeah, I think, I think the IEO subcommittee has just been great at working um, you know, we've just been really good at coordinating all the ecosystems and then focusing on the areas in between those ecosystems. So we're not um, leaving anything out and considering a lot of different groups, but um, yeah, so it's just using it as an example. So uh, let me just get through the end of this one. Oops, we'll go through the, the specific recommendations. So for shooting related, we talked about, um, we need targeting INE programs at bird hunters and rifle hunters. Um, and we talked about videos and some bear spray safety. In terms of the videos, um, Wyoga or Wyoming Outfitters and Guides Association, they are producing, or I think it's just about final, a video targeted at hunters. And um, they gave us a preview of it at the YES meeting. It's really nice. And so we're hoping that that's something that we could use or anybody could use. I think, you know, the point for the subcommittee is let's ask permission. I don't foresee any problems, but we would need some permission. And it's not, I don't think it's out quite yet, but pretty soon. So I don't think there's a need for us to go develop a new video if we've already got a really good one um, being finalized. The bear safety video at FW regional offices, Laura checked into that, right? And people are thinking about it, but there's Dylan some IT work issues going on. Yep. Yeah, Dylan, just let me know that FWP, they are undergoing a lot of their, the, a lot of the regional offices are undergoing like a remodel, um, but we're just working through IT to talk about if we can have TVs and view videos for customers and things like that. So that's why we put it in yellow. So it's on, it, it's work, we're working on it. It's just. <laughs> And then FWP also, they already include um, an extensive bear spray lesson in the Hunter's Ed. That was something we were wanting to look into and it's already in there. Yep. So um, we had a lot of recommendations on bear spray. Um, a number of agencies already hand out bear spray to the public. Um, we wanted, we think it'd be good to know and I don't know if we can do this right now with given time, but who is handing out bear spray? It'd be nice to be able to tell people 
who are the agencies that give it? Are you planning on doing that every year? I know from, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, it just depends. You know, if we have a little extra, if we have 500 bucks left in our budget that we need to spend, we'll spend it on bear spray. So it, you know, it's not always the case. It would probably be good to compile that information. Um, and I also wanted to mention that IGBC has those grants. Dylan just mentioned that. And that is something to consider if you're an agency or you don't even have to be an agency. Anybody can apply for these grants if you wanna um, start handing out bear spray. And to, uh, for you agencies, know, oh, one, sorry, one thing I remembered. For agencies, too, if IGBC, if we have leftover money in the IEO um, grant fund, that's a smaller amount, we do the same thing. We buy bear sprays and we are willing to hand them out to agencies to use for education purposes. So. Um, also another opportunity there. Uh, met with the group, our working group talked about bear spray rentals. And this one is a little tricky. You know, we were wanting to know, is this effective? Should IGBC encourage this kind of a thing? You know, after talking more about it, thinking more about it, there's some liability issues maybe. Um, there are groups, Glacier Outfitters is one of those that does handle bear spray rentals. Um, I think they, you know, the question is, how do you know it's been used or not used? And what if, it, you know, are there, what if it's damaged in some way? They do check those things. I think they weigh them to make sure, you know, the, the same amount of spray is in there, but it's, we just kind of are feeling like it might be better for agencies not to do that, or at least not the subcommittee to, to you know, encourage the agencies to do that. Leave it up to the private companies to do. Um, but I, we do think, Lori and I were poking around at this, <laughs> talking about like bear spray recycling information, where is that? And there we found, came across an, an old IGBC web page <laughs> that we got through Google, but it's not, it's not, it's totally outdated and it's difficult to find. And I don't even know if it's really valid anymore. So it might be good to have some more add some more to the website, especially as we're updating that website. Um, we also thought uh, this campaign on the importance of hunters carrying spray, why don't we ask Counter Assault, UDAB, some of the other bear spray companies if they would be willing to give discounts. And Lori, who's in, somebody's in Kalispell, right? Counter Assault. Counter Assault. Counter -assault. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's something that would be pretty quick and easy to, to talk with the company about. Uh, we also thought, you know, why don't we get some signs going to remind hunters to carry bear spray, put them up for us or wherever, you know, we can put them up at a whole number of locations. And then with the group also talked about billboards. Um, you know, billboards might be expensive, but it's, it's worth looking into the cost and targeting specific areas where you know a lot of hunters use these areas and may not be aware it's you know there's grizzly bears in the area so we just put it down as investigating how much would it cost you know are there people that could or groups that could cost share the billboards with us and then identifying those areas that would be most useful um, our next topic was auto strikes and we heard a lot about this yesterday. There's some really good things going on. Um, so in terms of this first one, in, increased subcommittee engagement and support for MDT scheduled projects, we have made some good progress there. MDT, Joe Wiegand is a member of the subcommittee. Um, you know, we had some questions, like there, there is an interagency working group for Highway 93. I think I, I mentioned it yesterday. I'm not sure what the plans are for that group to continue. I think they're going to continue, but there's some things that would be nice to know. And maybe at the December meeting, I think I mentioned um, if we have an agenda item to talk about the biological opinion, it might be good just to have a, a bigger discussion about that, see where we're going. Um, we also heard uh, from Kylie about the Missoula County piloting this, this small project collaborations with MDT and others. And, that was really great news. So there's some, you know, in terms of uh, support of an NGO coalition, it's not exactly that, but it's certainly 
going in that direction? How do we get other groups funding together to accomplish these projects? Um, you know, we also identified there's that Wildlife Transportation Steering Committee. I think, um, Randy, you mentioned that. And it'd be good to get some more info on that. Who are the reps and, you know, exactly what's going on with that? Um, increase coordination with MDT on research. Uh, oh yeah, I have a, this, <laughs> this C map is a note for myself here. I want to show you um, this uh, FWP completed this um, report on where grizzly bears are crossing Highway 93. And we thought it would be good just to show you the map of that area and where we're talking. So at the bottom of the map is Evero and then Polson is way up at the top. And you know, you can see the dots there and the key. There's some proposed crossing structures that Joe was talking a lot about in the pinky purple there by uh, between Ronan and St. Ignatius. Um, then there's the crossings with documented use and constructed wildlife crossings, mostly to the south. So we just wanted to give you a feel for that. So, you know, back to that, FWP completed that report for the crossings that was incorporated into the biological opinion that um, the Fish and Wildlife Service put out. We heard from Joe yesterday about Western Transportation Institute. They have started a study to look at, um, you know, different types of Cal guard alternatives, bump gates and culverts and jump outs. So that's encouraging that that's going on. Um, highway signs, you know, this is another one we, we haven't really made any progress on. Um, I think we need to target, figure out what are the areas that would be most effective uh, to establish some signs. We, did, we uh, thought looking into flashing signs might be really useful so that really gets people's attention. And then in terms of the roadkill pickup, yes, we, you know, continuing that is a good thing, but the compost sites, we know there's a need to put, to find out, to figure out where to put the carcasses and we have been using compost sites, but now we've got the CWD issue. So what does that mean for compost sites? Is that still something we should be doing? I think we need to look into that a little bit. Okay, railroad related, oops. The top three are what this, that earlier working group came up with. You know, um, it's great and last year we actually didn't have any railroad mortalities. Um, we got an update from Ben on the HCP that's expected to be completed this summer, but it does depend on extent of revisions. Um, we heard a little bit about the Highway Connectivity, Highway 2 Connectivity Working Group. Um, we were wanting to know if that group is going to continue to do some work in the future. Um, I put this third green bullet, Region 4, MDT, and Montana Highway Patrol. Last year, there was a situation where there were some... Is it horses? I think there was there was a horse hit on the highway and some other carcasses that were killed in a vehicle collision and attracting bears and it was kind of near the tracks and so um, we were trying to get those things picked up pretty quickly. MDT didn't have the you know a heavy duty truck to do it and had other priorities or they just didn't have the staffing resources. So it was a you know. For Gary Galati and Corey Lecker worked with Joe Wiegand and the Highway Patrol, you know, kind of come up with a strategy. It, it's not real complicated, but it's, I think Region 4 came up with a heavier duty truck to enable them to do that. They kind of came up with a strategy to be able to respond to those things a lot quicker. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, we just wanted to put this in front of the committee, subcommittee too, to find out are there other things that we think we should be doing in terms of railroad um, related mortalities. And then finally, we talked, our, our other category was site related conflict. 
you know, the Bear Smart Community Program that Dylan mentioned that really Lori is kind of spearheading through the uh, INE subcommittee, if we could get that thing going in different communities, that would really help us move forward on a lot of these issues. And so, Lori, do you want to give a quick where that is? Yeah, sure. So we are working right now, we're working together with it's the subcommittee members on um, the IEO subcommittee members and then Kim Johnston with people and carnivores dusty Laster from Wyoming fishing game and Mike battery from uh, BC are all on the committee and we are working through the criteria that BC had. Oh, and Kim, um, uh, Kim Inman from uh, down around Ennis. She worked a lot with the Big Sky, Bear Smart Big Sky. Um, so she's also helping on the committee. We're working on writing the draft at this time. Um, and then we're hoping to have that done and out to Bear Specialist and other people for comment and then getting it back to the um, IGBC this winter um, to see if they want to move forward. But it does really outline like how to assess your community, um, how to come up with a bear plan. And, and an education plan and um, and people that can help you over time with those plans. Um, and yeah, so hopefully so hopefully that will help with a lot of these, um, you know, waste, waste management is a big part of it. So, you know, how is your garbage picked up? Is there any laws against putting it out early or not? Um, things like that. And then encouraging, you know, bear uh, resistant containers um, and then just different ideas for the community to consider. So hopefully that gets approved. <laughs> yeah, it would be great because this is a huge, you know, if you think about how do we tackle all these things across mm -hmm. the NCDE, it's almost impossible. And, but to think about it in little parts and small communities, well, let's start, you know, if Whitefish is interested, let's encourage them to, to do some of this in their community and then move on to another one. Uh, yeah. So. I think that's a great thing. Um, chickens are a big, you know, they're, they're a huge issue <laughs> and they're gonna get bigger, I'm sure. So we, we thought, well, why don't we go over and talk with Murdoch's corporation, their headquarters is in Bozeman. Let's have somebody set up a meeting with them and encourage them to see if they could put up some displays or signs, handouts, have some brochures available that let people know about you know, chicken is a definitely attracting to, to bears. Have some fencing, you know, how to put up an electric fence around your chicken pen. And even talking about not selling wildlife feed. Um, and then finally, you know, the messaging on the importance of reporting conflicts and consequences of feeding bears or feeding wildlife, you know, that attracts bears. I think the agents have been doing a really good job of putting some messaging like this in press releases. I know this spring we've put a few press releases out um, and made sure that we you know, have that language in there too. So their agencies are, are doing a good job. We just hope that can, you know, continues. I think people need repetition <laughs> before they you know, establish it as habit. So that was the update I have in terms of, um, yeah, that conflict discussion. And so Randy, this leads into, you know, the whole work plan discussion. What I've done here is I've just copied and pasted from that work plan spreadsheet, um, what the goals and the bullets are the objectives. And so we were thinking, you know, it would be nice to incorporate some of these things from our conflict discussion, the red items, you know, what do we need to work on? Maybe think about it, incorporate them into the work plan. Yeah, that's a perfect transition, Hillary, because I think that, so first, th thanks for that summary. I, I, it might be helpful and, and maybe I'm just saying exactly what you just said. Um, but for me, it was a really interesting approach to what the NCDE was doing and that the, and all the subcommittees and when the chair of the IGBC, uh, Matt Hogan, sent his letter to the subcommittees to focus on this. It was it was data driven on where are where are the mortalities occurring. And so when, when that mortality subcommittee came together, um, it was a 
it was such a, on one hand, such an, a thoughtful approach, an easy approach to, well, so where are bears dying? Where can we focus our attention? But it really did focus us. I thought it was really good to focus on. And, and therefore, this report, I think, is super helpful. And as you identified, each of the subcommittees in going through that effort similarly did a lumping and splitting exercise of trying to figure out where their mortalities were. And semantics mattered because you could lump and split depending on where those mortalities were. But there was a lot of similarity between the subcommittees. And that's when we saw the education outreach um, mm -hmm. normalize across the, the, the different subcommittees. And so I, I just really appreciate this update and looking at it in that way and the progress that you guys have made and focusing on those things. And then I'm hearing from you, Hillary, a recommendation as we, as we, as your group and that mortality subcommittee has identified next step items or those red items where we still need to make some progress, making sure that that loops back into our 2021 and future work plan priorities. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I think it would be great. It's that's kind of the logical next step if we really want to accomplish it. And then, you know, one thing I've noticed the work plan, we haven't really done a great job of using it actively. And so this is something that I think, you know, if we stick some of these things in there, I think that would be great. So that that's perfect, because that's the conversation that I was hoping to have, which which is more about the use of the work plan. And so I'll be really candid when I, as I've worked on that, um, it's an exercise on, on one hand, I know that we're doing this amazing work. I can point to Chris Temple's presentation this morning. And I, and that, that's such important work and it's such a high priority. And, and I can be pretty certain that Chris Temple tomorrow is gonna go do that work, whether the work plan said it or not. I mean, maybe not, maybe she's right. taking some direction from the workplace, <laughs> but, but, I'm, but I'm confident that we would also be doing this education and outreach work, although maybe with less coordination were it not for the, the work plan, but the work plan isn't, isn't driving this activity. And so when it comes time to populate that work plan, it's, it's an exercise prior to the next IGBC meeting to update all the good work we've done Mm -hmm. And as I'm doing that, and I'm working with Lori and others to do that, it's not an exercise of looking at the work plan and seeing if we made progress as much as it is, how do we capture all the really good work we've done and where do we put it on the work plan to take credit for all that really good work? And so it, it's becoming a funny, a funny exercise. And the, the term probably isn't as accurate, but I I've been thinking it's a little bit of a wag the dog where we're doing really good work on the ground and then populating the work plan to reflect that. Where, where I think this mortality subcommittee was an effort to say, what do we need to be doing and let that drive the other direction. And I think that's really a really a turning point for us to talk about the work plan. So what I wanted to do just to tee this up a little bit um, and may, you might need to stop showing your screen, Hillary, but I'm gonna show, share my screen just so that the subcommittee members are familiar with this and have seen it. And I, I don't intend this to be a, a very long conversation about this particularly. I just want you to see what we're talking about. Can you guys see that okay? So this is just our work plan. And if you look down at the tabs at the bottom, you see each of the subcommittees have a tab. I curr I'm currently on the NCDE tab. And if I draw this way over to the left margin and the, and the top, you'll see goal one, complete the delisting process and transition to management of a delisted population. So I point this out because one of the challenges for us right now is that I believe we've met the majority of this goal in that we're, we now have um, met all of these accomplishments underneath it. The conservation strategies has been drafted. I, I, I don't I'm, I'm going to stop shy of recommending that we move away from this goal, because when we when you look at the activity items over on the far right side, jumping through these years, you see this area of around trend monitoring and and these areas where we're um, capturing uh, monitoring reports on these different elements. So I don't want to lose track that this still serves a really important role from my perspective of making sure that we're not losing track or not taking our eye off the ball on all the work it took to get to meeting this goal. So I think there's still a responsibility there. Um, and then 
I'll jump ahead to the next goal, reduce human bear conflicts and public safety concerns. So what I wanna point out here is that the mortality subcommittee was an action and activity that happened later on after these goals had been developed. And so when the mortality subcommittee met, they through their lumping and splitting exercise found here's where we're having mortalities with bears. How do we address this? Then the good work that they're doing is now overarching or happenstance hitting and missing among these any among these different goals. And it's becoming a little complicated to figure out exactly where the priorities from the mortality subcommittee are matching these work plan priorities. And when I go to the third goal, probably scrolled way too far, improve conditions that allow interchange and dispersal. So that you know, there's a lot that falls under that. And when you go to our current priorities, you see these um, consultations with forest plan efforts and these things. So what I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and, and I'm gonna pull up another one very similar to the one, Hillary, you and I had a, um, had a similar approach to this. So just pulling out some of the work we've done in goal one, and I all I have identified here um, is 2021, and then the, the bullets, the um, underneath of that, the, um, the goal, not the goals, but the objectives. So if underneath this, the mortality subcommittee work prioritized the automobile and site related and shooting related. And what I highlighted is some of the things that we saw on today's and yesterday's agenda so the, and Hillary, you did the exact same approach. So I'm, I'm gonna gloss over this pretty quickly. And then you identified in some of your red areas, things that, that were less identified or places that we still had some holes from our, our goal one. Similar to goal two, reduce human bear conflicts and public safety concerns in newly occupied areas. Um, highlighted here were some of the places where our agenda items hit on some of these things around outreach and awareness of, of bear movements and INE updates and next steps and prioritization around um, some projects on the Eastern Front related to grain, which was an identif identified priority for 2021. And then under goal three, improved conditions that allow interchange and dispersal, we saw Chris Temple's presentation around that um, conservation work on that landscape level and an update around Sarah Sell's work on potential connectivity routes and updates there and on and then um, the post Crick bridge area updates that we got from Joe Wiegand. So I only highlight these things and I'll stop sharing here to point out that where I think, I think we need to take a good look at our, our work plan as a document in an effort to try to get it geared back towards the real work that we're doing. And I don't, I don't mean that again, being very careful not to move away from what we've historically done in our initial goals, but instead kind of energize the NCDE towards our highest priority work. And Hillary, you, you and Lori and others have done a great job highlighting through the mortality subcommittee. From my perspective, that's probably the meat of it. I think that's where most of our efforts can be focused around those categories. So I'd, I'd ask for some input. Is it, is it a, an exercise perhaps of taking not just the mortality subcommittee stuff and figuring out how it fits into the work plan, but maybe a drafting effort to look at the work plan with fresh eyes and talk about what are our highest priorities and, and maybe letting the work plan start to drive our work instead of just being a place where we're capturing our stuff. I'll pause there, that's a lot to digest and see first if there's questions before we make any recommendations on where we go next. So Jody had her hand up, Jody, but I, I, I have a question, Randy, after Jody. Yeah, Jim. I think Jody, Jody did you still have a question? I don't oh, sorry. Wanna... Yeah, Jody, I, I couldn't see that your hand was up. I was busy chatting. You're good for now, Jody. Okay. Um, okay. Jim. Yeah. So things change, you know, so Laurie was in, you know, reminding me of how we used to do work plans. <laughs> And where we're at now, and you're right, we're just kind of populating it because everyone's busy and doing a lot of ongoing work. But in my mind, two big things have changed up here. You know, we have a lot of good ongoing work and issues that aren't going to go away, food storage, you know, I and E, but they've all taken kind of a different twist with this crush of humanity that showed up last year. So 
I think we need some kind of work plan item or group to focus on front country demands to land management agencies and even private land on on what we talked about before. You know, and part of that is you know what Kathy's doing, some of the rules of the game, what we've used to um, you know to hold tight to in these federal forest plans over the years. Uh, but it goes beyond that. It goes to ski hills and runs and heli skiing and every, the, the, all these new folks are showing up that have never lived with wildlife, uh, much less bears. We need to probably talk about that. And Dylan Tabish locally here has been working with the Tourism Bureaus, the Visitors Bureau, the Chambers of Commerce. I mean, they're still continuing to advertise Montana and we can't, you can't get a rental car up here until October. So it's, it's, everyone's kind of caught in an old way of doing business and we're kind of full until October, yet more people are gonna come. So there, there are bear issues there, clearly. I think we need a group to work on to work on that. And then I think uh, Hillary is still on the call. Hillary, are you there? Um, it, I think, yeah, we need, yeah. I think Hillary, just as a recommendation to the group, Randy, you as the chair, Hillary, you lead a group that would include Ken McDonald, uh, Whisper, you're now the, you know, Whisper's the wildlife program manager for CSKT and Buzz for the Blackfeet. Um, and some of us at FWP, we need a Senate Bill 337 work group right away. The rules yeah. of the game have changed. Um, and this is a really significant change. Um, up here alone, Tim Manley, 16 of the bears he captured on private property, working with private property owners uh, and moved last year uh, will not be eligible in the future because they were captured outside the recovery area. And it raises a whole bunch of questions. You know, with FWP, you know, we have Tim Manley, Jimmy Jonkel, Chad White, Wesley, and even Kim Anderson Libby, and then, and uh, much less elsewhere in the state. But if we are not allowed to move, capture and move bears, and again, we'll have to wait and let the dust settle with the arm rules, then it, it, it heretofore it's been a state response to private property that is now going to in my mind potentially transition to a federal response to private property when it comes to moving bears or relocating because as the as the bill reads and i could be wrong if the bear if the conflict site is outside of the recovery area, which 16 of the bears that Tim caught last year, which is most of them were, we are now not allowed to move them. Um, that would be, have to be federal government or tribal government or some uh, creative mix. So in my mind, I think as a group, we need to talk about all sorts of options. And, you know, and if you're just looking at bear conservation and blurring the lines of agencies, do we have staff that are at a point in their careers that have an interest in working for you now, where they could that work could continue to happen, and we do. Uh, do we have? Uh, what does Whisper? You know, does tribal programs? Does Buzz have staff? What What are the concerns there on moving bears? And Hillary, you have the authority uh, as the recovery coordinator and uh, and legally on where we let these bears go. Our ability to do that west of the divide, in particular, has just been removed, as far as I until reading the bill. I could be wrong, but I think we need a group. It's, I think it's our number one issue right now because human safety and our response to private property owners, we drop everything and respond when there's a grizzly bear on private property here, west of the divide. And this is an ag property, it's all residential. And so I think there's an expectation from the communities for us to do that and that, that has now changed. So Hillary, I think you should, my recommendation to you and Randy is to set up a group right away, Ken McDonald, what are, what are the rules the service wants the state to live by given that SB 337 passed? And that's a big deal. And then I think we could go to some of the, I mean, a lot of the other issues are ongoing, but I just would throw that out there, Randy and Hillary. It's a, the most significant change I've seen in my entire career for, in terms of our ability to, to keep property owners safe and respond uh, in part. And, and that, regulatory responsibility is shifted to the federal level. So instead of we're the state here to help you, now it's we're the federal government here to help you. So uh, we need to we need to probably set up a group. Yeah, you're you're right on, Jim. I've been thinking a lot about it, but yeah, I, I will certainly be tapping people soon. Uh, Jody. It, 
It says you came off of mute, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, so a couple of points and I invite Ken to jump in here, but we've been assured by the state that um, management of bears, that is trapping, helping people will continue. It's just the moving of bears that will be a federal responsibility. Um, that's the first point. The second is, is that um, how that works out, we totally agree with you, Jim. It seems like there's a lot of work to do there. We've reached out to your director um, requesting to set up a meeting because of course this doesn't just affect the NCD, it affects everywhere we have bears in Montana. So um, right with you, um, think that, that we need to have a discussion and a plan. Uh, this goes into effect next year, 2022. So we do have a little bit of time, but not a whole lot of time. And just to abuse anyone of any notion, um, Fish and Wildlife Service did not just get a bunch of money so we can hire everybody and have you work for us. We would love that, that would be awesome. But having that as even a potential um, solution is probably not in the works, so. Great, thanks Jody. Ken? Thanks Randy. Um, so I agree with Jim on that part, but it also highlights, um, go back to the work plan. The, the very first goal in that work plan was, you know, work towards delisting of the bears. And, and you're right, all of the, the work that's being done um, has got us to recovery and is helping sustain recovery. Um, so we're there, the, the issues, the delisting piece and, you know, as part of this legislative discussion, um, you know, everybody points to Yellowstone that, it, that it's been delisted twice and the courts have shot it down. And, and I made the point, there's never been an attempt, there's never been a proposed delisting rule for the NCDE. And, and I would assert that the NCDE would be easier because there's not three states and three state politics going on. Um, so I, I would, I guess I would advocate that that still be a, a priority for the subcommittee, you know, and it may be that um, from a work plan perspective, we've done all the things that, that have been requested. We have a conservation strategy. We've got the monitoring in place. Um, we've got, we're increasing the conflict response, things like that. Um, and it's, it's, it's like, where do we go now? And so I would, I would advocate that this committee, you know, at least make a recommendation to the to the IGBC that, that you know, we request the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Department of Interior to, to at least move on delisting. Jody mentioned there were some, some issues related to the court case, which I'm assuming is the Yellowstone court case um, that, that needed to be resolved. And, and so if, there's, if there are those kinds of things, it would be good to know you know what what they are specific to the NCDE because you know things like the recalibration issue which is one of the the real sticklers with the Yellowstone I don't think is an issue with the NCDE with the way we've come up with the mortality thresholds and and things like that so that that'd be my first piece the other one is we do have that that conservation strategy I recognize that the conservation strategy is intended to be a, a post delisting management plan but but pretty much it's it's the things we're doing now and things we're committed to doing and and so maybe the you know the foundation for a work plan moving on is checking back in with what have we committed to in that conservation strategy and and are we doing it and how are we doing it so that that'd be my input to the work plan discussion thanks ken yeah uh bill yeah, thanks. Um, you know, Ken, I totally agree with you. From my perspective, it seems like um, I do think, as Randy pointed out, we, we've met the items um, in our work plan that would be um, required to move forward with delisting. So I do, I would support your idea that this subcommittee move forward to the IGBC with that. Um, to, to start down that path. Um, I, I also support your idea that we should begin to look at amending our work plan to reflect the agreements we've agreed to in the conservation strategy. Um, 
because I think those things, those two things tie together. I know that our existing work plan and much of the conservation strategy um, align anyway, right. but um, we've done a lot of work. We've got a bunch of agreement there on the conservation strategy. And we're actually, the, the work plan is really a subset in my mind of that conservation strategy. So I think, um, totally agree with your perspective and, and I would uh, support uh, your proposal. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Kurt. Yeah, I'll echo what Bill said. I support as well. And I don't want to repeat what Bill said, but uh, or Ken and, and agree with everything. I think the other aspect that I'd be curious about that would help us out if it doesn't get delisted is, is um, maybe have the mortality group focus in on Again, it, it feels to me like we're trying to create all roads equal. And it feels to me like the mortality of, of the bears is often caused from the highways. And it seems like the science that we used for that we're, we're taking and putting it as on the same type of science as, as a forest road where you're traveling 15 to 30 miles an hour versus 65. So just something to think through from my perspective, again, still fairly new in the, the NCDE, but um, I would be interested in, in breaking out the different roads versus lumping them all together uh, in, in terms of the fitness side of the house. Um, but again, fully support and would encourage the subcommittee to, to propose delisting um, as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kurt. Hey, Randy. Yeah, Hillary. I wanted to um, respond to Ken, your comments and some others too. You know, I know that our SSA, our species status assessment, I gave an update on that yesterday. We reviewed all, well, we reviewed the NCDE, the status of it, and we did say yes. We, we definitely acknowledge recovery criteria have been met. Biologically, the population's recovered. But you know, if we're talking about delisting, there's more needed than that. We've got to walk through the five factors, habitat. And, um, adequate regulatory mechanisms is a big one. And it's one that has proved problems in, in, other, um, in the GYE. It's one of the issues. Uh, you know, I think from our perspective, and I'm sure you, you know this, Ken, you know, these legislative bills, the Senate Bill 98 and the 337, that's, those are really problematic in terms of demonstrating that we have adequate regulatory mechanisms. If 337 is signed, it says Montana's not willing to relocate bears and outside the recovery zone. It, that, that amounts to a lot of bears. And, um, you know, it might, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't done the math, but we do have mortality limits and it seems to me, you know, those, would be exceeded, or there's a good chance. And I know you know all of this, but that's, to me, that is a big problem for delisting. And of course, we haven't done the analysis, the bills are not signed yet, but um, that's an important part. We need to demonstrate that regulatory mechanisms are adequate. Yeah, one, one quick point on that, on 337 on the transplanting outside recovery zones is, is there specific wording that says while they're listed. So, so that okay. isn't out. If they were delisted, then that, that doesn't apply. Um, at least okay. statutorily, we obviously still have commission issues and things like that, but no, and I hear you. Um, yeah. And it is sort of a chicken and egg issue because the, you know, that was one of the arguments brought up during the legislative session. And the response was, is there's no, confidence that the delisting is ever going to happen you know it's not even being proposed and so therefore this is our response and so so now we have this response that you know we come back and say well now we can't propose delisting because we don't have regulatory mechanisms and, and I, I think i think at least um, from a, a you know an optics point of view is if we think that they're recovered we think the dps is still a legitimate way to go that, that proposing the proposing delisting and, and, and really showing we've met all the, recri recri bah, the recovery criteria 
uh, will help us a bunch. Yeah, and you know, I think I've mentioned it yesterday too. I, I mean, thanks for that, Ken. It, it, you know, we haven't had a chance to brief the administration on all things Grizzly yet. They're still figuring out what direction they want to do. And so um, right. we don't know that yet. Randy, I did also want to point out that there's been some good discussion in the chat about the CWD and the um, and the compost site. So hopefully we I don't want to miss that. Yeah, thanks, Lori. And Jim. Oop, Jim, you're muted. That was a boomer move. Um, three things I had written down, the front country thing, and of course, what we've been talking about here recently. But the third one is, if indeed, you know, Hillary and Ben hinted at it, that the HCP is actually going to go through, that's another, frankly, uh, you know, the fiscal agent for the HCP with the, is the Outdoor Legacy Foundation, but they're going to need help in implementation. So we probably need a work item to form, you know, with Buzz and the Blackfeet tribe and his team, FWP and the service and the park and the forest are all kind of in that zone. And I think it goes from just south of Eureka out onto the prairie east, maybe all the way to, to Cut Bank. I, I can't remember. But if indeed that's going to happen, and then that's an annual cycle of funding to good projects on the ground, uh, and it runs the gamut, and, it, and it's all in buckets of, of money that are earmarked for bears. So if that actually happens, we should probably in the work plan have a some sort of subgroup work group that's going to have to help Mitch King at, at the Outdoor Legacy Foundation because you know clearly he can do the fiscal uh, management and accountability and legal and tax and all that good stuff but it's going to take a group effort to implement that um, so just a suggestion to when, when when that is actually approved yeah thanks Jim and I'm just collecting a lot of thoughts here right now and and we'll probably keep collecting these as we decide as a subcommittee, what do we want to focus on? And then we'll have to talk a little bit about how we want to do that. Uh, Jody, is your hand back up? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the goal. Number one, we have there the delisting process. Um, I want to remind folks that in 2019, we had, the IGBC had a um, retreat where we revisited our mission and what our goals were and how we wanted to, you know, kind of move into this, you know, next decade or two. And we really um, focused some of our language on kind of this broader idea of conservation of grizzly bear populations, not to say that we didn't still support delisting and recovery, but the idea that the IGBC isn't gonna go away if these populations are delisted, we still all agree that we have a role in long-term conservation. And I wonder if our goal there shouldn't be more reflective of that rather than this idea that delisting is our goal, um, that it's really about this conservation of, of as Hillary says, a biologically recovered population. Um, just a thought for people to think about. Um, I don't know if everybody has access to the notes from that meeting um, back from 2019. Um, I know Dave and Diamond has them. I have a really ugly track changes version, but I think it would help folks to look at that and really um, ponder that because I think it really ties into what Hillary and Lori went over about um, the, the management issues and what you're saying, Randy, about how, we, how we're kind of letting the tail wag the dog and how we should really be thinking more about what it is that we're trying to do rather than it is what we are doing, I guess. So just some thoughts. No, that's really helpful, Jody, because I felt as I'm, as I'm thinking through this, you know, the, with the kind of things that Jim brought up, front country and recreation, um, preparation for helping implement HCP if there's some outcomes there. Um, the ongoing work from the mortality subcommittee with those red items that Hillary identified. There's, there's still a suite of things that we should be doing. 
And I really appreciated the checking back in on the conservation strategies. I mean, there's an exercise to be done there to make sure that we're, we're doing what we said we would do and, and, and paying attention where we need to there so we don't lose sight of that. And it seems to me that these efforts are, if tomorrow the NCDE, not that we would do this, but I'm just entertaining this in my head about how this would happen. So we have a position statement and a recommendation around delisting, okay. And, and off it goes, so we don't disband. And I'm not, I don't mean to undermine that, that sentiment, but I think as I think about the role of this group and we're coordinated across all these jurisdiction and agencies and responsibilities, We've been really effective at identifying priority things to be working on. And Jim had a basket of things and some others there that I, I think that might be our, our strongest role right now, not to lose sight of what whether we're delisted or not, but instead rise above it or beyond it. Because I, I think that's just, it mires us in some politics and some conversations where not particularly productive. And I, I think we could be more productive focusing on the, the um, sustainability and or the the not recovery as much as just what does it mean to live with bears on this big landscape and reduce conflict and keep and persist so i, I want i don't want to shut this conversation down too soon i want to make sure that we hear people's ideas and then i've got to start moving us towards how do we take some action on a few things here but kurt are, is your hand up still And maybe it's not. Um, so Kurt, I see your hand up, but I'll I'll keep going here. Any other thoughts or inputs from folks on on largely around our work effort and next steps? I've got a, a suite of things here to discuss yet. But I don't want to miss any. Sorry, Randy, my hand was up, but it was from the previous one. Okay, thanks, Kurt. Hey Randy, is there um, anything associated? I can't, I can't. I just can't remember with the US two in the work plan in terms of connectivity. Uh, boy, after going through that recently in the twenty twenty one priority work, I don't believe so. But somebody else, please tell me if you have an idea there or something that we might be. And if not, is that a recommendation, Tabitha, that we might? look to include that in some of something that we're working on or looking at yeah i just i just feel like it's uh, still one of those those uh, places where um we could um probably improve connectivity especially given we're already you know looking at that and there's another one group um chipping away at that question okay great thanks tabitha so um i'm going to walk through a little of some of the things we talked about and i and I'm going to editorialize here a little bit. Jim brought up the front country and recreation. Um, it would be really easy to say we have the mortality subcommittee working on front country stuff, but I think what Jim identified was um, pointing at the recreation at a scale and pace that we've not seen before. Um, and it's not just in Kalispell, it's other places. And then the impacts that that has on tourism and dispersed camping. We have all these limits on recreation and monitoring of recreation sites as we know that there's conflict with sites. And we have food storage and posting food storage and communicating about all that. And then you see all these pop up dispersed camping sites and piles of dirty diapers and whatever else in images I pop up in my head. Or I think it was the, the T-bone steaks that were stacked up on the styrofoam containers. And I just, I, I know that we're going to be dealing with that again this summer and but uh, maybe it's a conversation around this larger front country issue at with a with an asterisk around recreation. Jim your thought on the Senate bill 30, 337 what I heard from Jody and Ken that there are ongoing conversations there it feels like the scale of that is much larger than the NCDE and I know we need to coordinate there um, it seems like we might punt on that one just momentarily to see if that's not going to get addressed at a larger scale rather than us trying to pick that up does that and, make sense and, and also see if it gets signed and you know we assuming it does yeah but it, if it does it does it, it really uh changes the rules of engagement 
for private property owners, uh, particularly west of the divide, since we're not the ranching uh, focus here, it's smaller residential pieces. So um, I think that it involves a big I &E effort too on, on who can do what, what agency, tribe, state, federal, just so the public, it's fair to the public to know, you know who to call and what we can do. And, and if it's a joint effort, you know, we catch the bear and Hillary moves it or how, whatever the rules end up being after the arm rules, yeah. And, and it is larger, but I think if once that happens, uh, keep it on our radar screen because that does, it's a pretty significant uh, potential change while they're still listed. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I think it, I, I, I hear some, uh, an exercise in what Jody mentioned yesterday and then mentioned again today. Um, there there were, was the court case in Yellowstone that pointed to some issues that, and so I thought that we still have some work to do. Um, it would be helpful to see that and try to be explicit about what those things are in the NCDE um, that might be action items or things that we need to shore up or make sure that we're, we're ready for. And that that's an exercise in and of itself, I think. Another exercise that may not be a lot of work, but it could be, um, is a check back in on the conservation strategies. Are we doing what we said we would do? Um, the, we have the suite of mortality, mortality subcommittee, uh, high priorities that Lori and Hillary teed up in advance of this conversation. Um, preparation for HCP implementation, that again might be a, a track and monitor to see if and when that happens. And if it does, then be ready to get a team of folks and or identify what work needs to be done there. And then US2 transportation um, and identifying that as a priority in that. So what we, what I thank you all for the, the input, I think that really helped me. I, we kind of have a mixed bag of new items, not before mentioned that need to be brought in, a couple tasks. And then I think a look at our work plan um, and, and an updating of the work plan so that it's reflecting these priorities. And this is gonna take some effort. So I, I thought what I might try to do is walk us through and see if how we see getting some of these things done. Um, and I, I think one, boy, and these are gonna be running hand in hand. So one idea might be to get some volunteers to, to work on some of these individual pieces. The, the hand in hand piece running parallel is if we're, if we're updating the work plan itself, some of the outcomes from these other things don't have a place to land and, and until that work plan is looked at again. Um, so, so I'll pause here first to see if there's some suggestions on folks who may wanna be involved in some of these and carry some of these issues and before we, and then bring them back maybe to another group looking at a refresh of the work plan. Thoughts or volunteers first? And Randy, I saw Kurt's hand go up, so that might be new too. Okay, yeah, Kurt. Yeah, Randy, uh, this was prior to you asking for volunteers, but just on that conservation, that check-in on the conservation strategy. And the reason why I brought up roads um, from my perspective is not only are we doing what we said, but are there unintended consequences maybe? Um, and for an example, we had a, a timber sale that just happened and it cost us about uh, $50,000 to try to stay within the, the roads um, standards that we have, right? And so if you think about one timber sale, that's $50,000 less that we're able to do other restoration work because of the economics that it causes. You know, if you, if that happens a lot, how much money is that really um, buying us. So that's why I brought that up. So I think there's two, two aspects. So we're doing what we said in the conservation strategy and then, you know, what are some of those possible unintended consequences and, and done for the right reasons, but are we getting essentially our money's worth, if you will. So anyways, that was what I wanted to talk through there um, on that. Thanks, Randy. Good. Thanks, Kurt. So let me, on that point, on the conservation strategies, I'm going to I'm going to call on somebody here. He's probably going to wince, but Scott Jackson, I know you coordinated and helped take the lead on the conservation strategies. And I'm, I'm wondering if um, with, with, an, with an eye towards, are we doing what we said we would do and, and following up on that, 
I wonder if maybe that might be a role if you would be willing to at least lead a group to just do a, a, a recheck on the conservation strategies, the, the goal of which would be to identify anything that we're, we're a little soft or we need to pick something up there. And I. Yeah, I didn't have my camera on, so you didn't see the wince, Randy, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I was kind of thinking along the same line, so I'd be glad to, um, to take a look at that, see where we're, you know, if we are, I know we have the monitoring reports that do inform some of that, that, you know, are we doing what we said we did, uh, what we say we would do uh, relative to monitoring, but the other components of that too, I think uh, it's valuable to take a look at that and, and make sure we we're doing what, what all components of the strategy tell us to do. So um, yes, I will, um, I can get a group together. I'd be looking for some help with that. So if uh, folks want to maybe send me a, a note uh, indicating your interest in helping with that, please do. And would you be looking, Randy, do you think for a, um, a report back at the next subcommittee meeting or something prior to that? Well, my sense was maybe prior. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think the other effort that Jody mentioned about um, looking at the court case in Yellowstone, it seems to me that if there are items in that that need to be addressed, that we might try to update the conservation strategies to reflect anything where we saw something from the Yellowstone ecosystem court case that lets us think that we need to make sure that we're incorporating that. But the reason I say maybe sooner is it'd be nice to see, rather than just a report back at the next meeting, have a little more action on what product would look like, I think is, is what I was thinking. Okay. I don't have a definitive timeline, so maybe I can, I can help work offline with who's working on what. And that's probably how I see this coming out of this meeting is I would identify the folks working on different pieces and then work to identify some timelines and when we think we can get some of that returned. Okay. Yeah. We'll communicate with that. And uh, so I'm already getting some some notes of, of folks willing to help. So I appreciate that. And others, um, please reach out to me and let me know your preference and I'll pull something together and we'll start looking at that. So the, the second item that I mentioned, and thanks, Scott. Um, yep. The From Hillary or Jody, what what do you think it would take from your perspective to to do a little crosswalk between that Yellowstone ecosystem and, and what where we are with the NCDE? Is that something relatively quick? Is that something that comes to mind quickly? And then can we incorporate that into the work that Scott's doing? Yeah, sure, I'm, I will definitely look at it. There were three main issues in the court opinion and, and there's one specifically that might have implications for NCDE. So I can look into that more. Okay, thanks Hillary. And then I think um, there's another one and this goes back to Hillary and and Lori, the you guys identified some kind of next step priority items and and wanting to bring those back into the work plan. I'm, I'm wondering if, as a start to that, if you guys would be willing to also lead a bit of an effort of actually starting to tinker with the work plan itself, and if that's just a matter of incorporating those red items and priorities into that, then okay. But as you're doing that and an update to the conservation strategies, if that's the beginning of a re-edit of our goals or making sure that we're focused where we wanna be focused. Um, and, and I think an outcome of the, the re-look at the conservation strategies by Scott and that group might also inform next steps for that work plan. Does that make sense if I suggest that maybe as you guys look at that, that you'll also be opening up the work plan? Does that seem like a start there or is that problematic or should we get a different group looking at that? I can certainly be involved. I would hope, I would ask that we'd have some other volunteers and have it more of a Lori and Hillary deal, <laughs> and less of a Lori Hillary deal and more of a small working group. It would be good to have some executive committee or some subcommittee members. Uh, Lori, what do you think? No, <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> and uh, I do think that for the um, highway mortalities and there's been a, in the chat, like the CWD, it looks like there's a little working group and 
um, Tabitha and Whisper and some other people have really been chatting about it and who would be good for that work group so we can kind of include that. But yes, if more people want to help out on some of the other ones, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll um, maybe get some help from folks. I'm wondering, um, looking at the group here, I'm going to be hesitant to call anybody out. So if, if we have some volunteers, subcommittee members who might be willing to work on that, um, and it's an effort both at, at grabbing some of these items that we've identified today and incorporating, the, incorporating them into the work plan, but also taking a fresh look at the work plan. Um, and I, not to put Bill Avey on the spot, but I know Bill, as that starts to build um, as the new chair, I think you're gonna wanna have an attention on that work plan and know that progress. So at a, at a minimum, I'd suggest you keep the pulse of it. Definitely, I was thinking the same. And then, um, and I'll, I'll summarize these points. Um, I see the US2 transportation, the suggestion um, from, I, I forget, I think it was uh, Jim Williams and, and others who suggested back to Dylan Tabish to look at an I and E effort to figure out a way to demonstrate all of the monitoring efforts that Kathy's doing so that we can see all of those recreation and development and roads and all those impacts in a way that's really consumable. I think that's another line item activity here that we can be working on. Yeah, that sounds good, Randy. I will, uh, I'll kind of put a team together, or figure, get that effort going. Okay. And then, so, and then a couple of these might just be placeholders outcome of the um, HCP and the others. So with that in mind, I'm not going to pin everybody down too much for obviously we're not going to accomplish any of this stuff today. Um, so I'll, I'll draft a note for um, some assignments and some next steps and incorporate that and try to get that out to the subcommittee members um, looking for some volunteers to help probably on a, a fresh look at that work plan to make sure that that's addressed. That's helping drive our activities rather than just being a collecting point of what we're doing. So um, and thank you guys very much for being willing to have this conversation and walking through it. It's a, it's a, it's a dry subject, but at the meat of it is all the really important work we're doing, which is a lot more exciting. So I wanted to um, transition before we get to a public comment period. Um, I just want to note in the agenda item, it's a transition point for us to hand over the chair responsibilities to our vice chair, Bill Avey. And I was chuckling to myself as I was readying to do this. I'll show you what I found on my desk the other day, which, which was the, these things, which are place cards for back in a time we used to meet. And I know a lot of you young pups don't remember this, but we used to meet and actually be in the same place in the same room and places at the same time. So Bill, I have a package that I'll put together and send your way. It's, it's a whole bunch of these kinds of things. Uh, file folders and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing I came across was this gavel, which I thought was super cool when I got this. But unfortunately, I don't think maybe but one meeting I had a chance to actually strike this thing and make some noise with it. So I'll be sending that over to you as well. You can hit it twice for me the next time we have a meeting in person and you're able to pull people together. Um, but with that, Bill, I want to hand the meeting over to you and um, very much appreciate the opportunity to have served as a chair and to help this group make any progress that we have made. Certainly didn't do anything other than organize you. It's an amazing group of people and energy here and uh, very, very glad to have been able to serve in this capacity for this short period of time. And I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be super active and involved. So thank you all and, and thanks, Bill. Okay, hey, Randy, thank you. And I think I speak for everybody else on the committee with your leadership, the subcommittee, your leadership has been outstanding and, and um, yeah, we do have a lot of pretty exceptional, passionate folks that are capable of great getting great amount of work done for a great cause. That being said, um, no work gets done without organization. So um, you've been an outstanding leader and big shoes, big boots for me to fill. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I think our first order of business um, is really selecting a vice chair and um, 
Jody and I chatted a little bit this morning offline um, prior to the meeting. And I, I would propose for us to consider, not to implement today, but for us to consider um, as we think some rotations down the road, the chair is always rotated between a federal and state um, uh, position. And I would offer that I think um, my personal opinion is that I would like to see our committee consider our First Nations uh, members as chairs as well in that rotation. And that uh, perhaps um, down the road at a meeting, um, while we're not ready to do it today, that we um, make whatever necessary change to our bylaws to show that they, the chair would rotate federal, state, First Nations. Um, so I just wanted to throw that on the radar screen um, today um, and ask folks to be thinking about that down the road. Um, that being said, um, I think given where we are at today, um, I am looking for nominations uh, from state agencies, state partners here um, for nominations for the vice chair behind me. So I'd open up the floor and if you could raise your hands on the um, or turn your camera on, I'll try to work through that. Yes, Randy. So Bill, we, we, uh, we, several of us talking about the vice chair in that it's bounced back and forth between federal and state. Um, we supported too the idea of, of First Nations representation. Um, and I think what more out of deference to them, I'm, I'm wondering if, if it would be worthwhile um, I guess getting a sense of capacity and interest there. Um, I think I was, I am in nominating or potentially nominating, there might be an interest knowing that the vice chair serves for two years, assisting where they can your role bill. And then, so we've got a little bit of a runway there before the vice chair would be nominated or take the seat as the chair. I wonder if, if there isn't an opportunity to scope that just a little to see if there's capacity and interest um, before we maybe forward a nomination for a vice chair. So, so Randy, my understanding is there were some conversations and we felt, I mean, given the transition in particular right now, um, and I don't want to speak for folks, but my understanding information I have is, um, that, um, even that, that, that two year run, runway at this point in time is probably a little premature. Okay. And perhaps, but the next rotation. Well, well, with that then, and unfortunately, he's not here, so that just makes the nomination all all the sweeter. But, but I think we'd probably consider maybe going back to Gary Bertolotti, um, for from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. He served as the chair, I think, eight years ago, um, and in the back and forth around, or it will have been eight years potentially by the time that it would come back around. But I would certainly nominate Gary. All right, we have a nomination on the floor. Uh, are there any seconds? Yes, Jody. Yeah, I was just wondering um, if there were any other state agencies that were interested in throwing their name in. You know, we typically, you know, we, we have kind of a pattern and I'm wondering, it'd be nice to embrace some other entities like perhaps DNRC or even DOT um, now that they're part of the panel. Um, just, some, just some thoughts about that. Yeah, thanks, Jody. And I can speak to that a little bit. I did reach out to DNRC. Um, and they'll, and they were interested, but some potential transitions there, and and didn't know that they'd be 
really ready to step somebody up into that role. And then similarly, <clears throat> had a really nice conversation um, with Department of Transportation and seeing if maybe they might be, um, and talk to Joe about, is there a potential role there? And um, maybe, maybe in the future for sure, um, but wasn't necessarily jumping to jump in right quite yet. Yeah, and I'd, I'd speak to that, Randy, and I really, really appreciated that conversation. Um, right now, you know, my, my workload would be a little bit prohibitive on it, but I really appreciated that, that thought, and, and I think uh, transportation would, would definitely uh, consider it, you know, when, when I or somebody else in the department might be able to handle it. So I'd, I wanted to say thanks for that again. Okay, I appreciate that. So I'm going to go back to, is there a second on the nomination of Gary Bertolotti from Fish, Wildlife and Parks? Yes, Tabitha? Uh, I'll second that. Okay, thank you very much. Any additional discussion? Okay, not seeing any hands. I'm just going to go ahead and open it up for a, a vote to affirm Gary Bertolotti as the incoming vice chair. Um, so can you please uh, just either state I or turn on your camera and um, provide a, a thumbs up with that, but hang on, I just saw, oh, nope, I guess not. So if you can give me a thumbs up or, or, I, or uh, just an I, please. Aye. All right. I think I've seen enough. It looks like Gary Bertolotti will be my vice chair. Um, so Randy, do you want to convey that to Gary or would you like me to? Um, I can, I can send him a note. Okay. Thank you very much. And then I think our last order of business to, um, at the meeting is to open it up for public comment. So I would ask folks to please raise their hands and we'll call on you. If we can do that or throw something in the chat. And Dylan, can you help me with this, please? Yep, yep, uh, very, you stated it perfectly and it looks like we do have, uh, Keith has raised his hand, so Keith, I'm gonna uh, unmute you, or I guess allow you to talk, unmute yourself, please state your name, where you're from, and organizations you're affiliated with. Army. Yeah, this is Keith Hammer. I'm with Swan View Coalition up here uh, near Big Fork in Kalispell, Montana. And uh, I'll just read the question that I posted. Is Kathy Ake still around? This question is for her. Anyway, uh, I believe so. Uh, I believe she is Keith, but maybe state your question. And then if she's not uh, still at her computer, um, I can run her down and email her and then we can get you an email response back. Okay, great. Thank you. So what I'm asking of Kathy is how the, the baseline was established for developed recreation sites for the monitoring under the conservation strategy. This came up on the flathead um, as Jim Williams alluded to a while ago there was a proposal by the Flathead to build four rental cabins at the semi-primitive Bunker Park campground on the Flathead National Forest right up against the Bob Marshall boundary uh, upstream from Spotted Bear. And in that proposal, the Flathead, the, or the district ranger, um, claimed that the campground itself was within the baseline, but that the baseline had not set a capacity for the campground and then also claimed that to build four cabins there 
and to drill a freshwater well, none of which exist at that site, that that would not increase the capacity of the campground and hence would not violate the conservation strategy nor count against the once in 10 years that you're allowed to increase capacity in a bare subunit. So that brings us back where, you know, a number of commenters, including some that helped draft the conservation strategy, um, claim that, well, that no, this does violate the conservation strategy. So back to the question is how was the baseline established and did campgrounds have capacity established in the baseline? Um, okay, so the baseline was established I basically went around to every agency. Um, sorry, I had a mask on. Um, I went around to every agency, uh, sat down with the folks, um, went through a listing with them. Um, Kathy, you're a little hard to hear. I don't know if you can speak closer to your microphone. Actually, I am fairly close to my microphone. I'm having computer issues today, I think. Um, <laughs> I went to every um, agency unit and went through to try to develop a list with them at that time to get capacities of the various um, sites that needed a capacity as well as what just a whole listing of all of their sites. There were a few campgrounds um, and Flathead was not alone on that one that I could not get the agency to give me a capacity on because they didn't really set one for that particular area. Um, it, they called it unlimited, um, but that's the best answer I can give you on the baseline. It was done originally, um, and I went to every single unit, um, and we sat down and came up with the list, and that is what they have been basing it off of since then. As for the rest of it, um, I think that's going to have to go through um, our planning and um, uh Planning staff officer Michelle Dragu, as well as not Michelle Dragu, Will Young, as well as Michelle Dragu on the uh, FOIA site. So that's the best I can give you for an answer. Please. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, so, Kathy, would you be so kind as to um, perhaps? just send an email with that explanation back to Keith because the audio was very, very broken and I'm not sure he heard it. I could not hear it all. Um, I could hear most of it, but I couldn't hear it all. And I think perhaps um, if you'd be so kind to do that or send it to me and I'll, I'll can forward it to Keith if you don't have his email. Um, okay. I'll follow up. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Bill. Any other uh, comments in the public, please uh, raise your hand and I will um, unmute you. Any comments out there? I'll kind of pause here and, and tell Bill, Bill if you want to take it away. But if you have a comment, please raise your hand. Or if you'd like, you can type it in the Q&A as well. We'll give folks another few minutes. And I guess while we're pausing here to wait for comments, um, I am collecting PDFs of folks' presentation from the last couple of days, and then we'll try to get those loaded onto the IGBC website, along with the video recording of this meeting um, and yesterday's meeting as soon as possible. So uh, those will be under the on the IGBC website under the NCDE subcommittee section. Well, I'm not seeing any additional comments. Are you, Dylan? Nope. Okay. 
So we'll go ahead and move to close the meeting. Um, Randy, I have to tell you, you might want to keep the gavel, but perhaps you could send me Dylan. Um, it would be much appreciated. Thank you very much, Dylan. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, with that, folks, this will close our meeting. Um, we will see where we're at next fall uh, related to an in-person meeting, a hybrid meeting, or a Zoom meeting. Um, I think we'll just have to see how things progress here in the country and the state. Um, but with that, um, I look forward to being the chair and uh, have a lot to learn, uh, but I couldn't imagine doing it without a stronger group of folks around. So thank you all very much. And I think that concludes the meeting. Great, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Randy.